Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Botanical Survey of India, I, Shabnam Bandopadhyay, Preservation Assistant, Central National Herbarium, Howrah, would like to express our immense pleasure to welcome you all to the one-day national webinar entitled Traditional Knowledge and Ethnobotany in Remembrance of late Dr. S. K. Jain, father of Indian ethnobotany on his first death anniversary. Your presence itself speaks volumes about the importance of today's webinar. Quoting the famous Ayurveda book, Materia Medica, there is no plant on earth which has got no medicinal value, and thus arises the importance of ethnobotany, its research practices, and implementations. Ethnobotany in India started when British botanists came to India and searched for plants to study and noted their native uses. Studies on ethnobotany in India were pioneered by Dr. E. K. Janaki Ammal in 1956 and later on nurtured by Dr. S. K. Jain 1963 onwards. Dr. S. K. Jain's botanical career was groomed mainly with the Botanical Survey of India, where he started working as a systematic botanist at Pune in 1956, and then as an economic botanist at Allahabad and Calcutta, and retired as the director of BSI in 1984. Better known as the father of Indian ethnobotany, the ethnobotanical research led by Dr. Chen has made a worldwide impact. Until 50 years ago, folk medicines in India survived in two main forms. Firstly, as grandma's recipes in towns, and secondly, as unrecorded traditional knowledge among village medicine men. The only records covered some household remedies practiced occasionally, but were rarely taken serious by the scientific community. The efforts of Dr. Jen have brought about a sea change in this direction over the last five decades. He has motivated and guided scientists from various backgrounds, botanists, foresters, Ayurveda and Yunani doctors, anthropologists, sociologists, and linguists to do intensive fieldwork and document the traditional knowledge in an organized manner. Now, ethnobotany is an important focus area of research for major funding agencies in India. The discipline has been instrumental to understand the scientific basis of our cultural heritage and has acted as a bridge between many social and physical sciences and between classical botany and medical sciences. The efforts of Dr. Chen has led universities to include Ethnobotany in graduate, postgraduate, MPhil, and PhD programs. The subject has advanced in India so quickly that Dr. Jain himself was astonished and it compelled him to write about divine botany and dynamism in ethnobotany. On August 14th, 1995, on the eve of Independence Day of India, he led the foundation for the Institute of Ethnobiology, which started functioning initially in NBRI Lucknow. He is the founder of four other scientific societies, namely International Society of Tropical Ecology, International Commission on Ethnobotany, Society of Ethnobotanists, and Association for Plant Taxonomy. On this note, I would once again like to welcome all our guests of today's occasion, Dr. A.K. Goel, Vice President, Society of Ethnobotanists, Lucknow, Dr. R.W. Busman, Professor of Ethnobotany and Head, Ilya State University, Tbilisi, Georgia, and Dr. Arvind Saklani, Vice President, Sami Sabinsa Group, Bangalore, Karnataka. We also welcome all the head of offices and scientists and staffs of various regional centers of BSI 
and all other participants from across the country who are already connected with us in this workshop virtually. Our webinar today comprises the inaugural session, guest lectures, and then followed by the closing ceremony. On this note, may I please request Dr. J. Jayanti, Scientist E, VSI headquarters, to elaborate on the importance of today's webinar. Thank you, Ms. Shabnam. Very good morning to everyone and welcome to today's webinar on traditional knowledge and ethnobotany organized by Botanical Survey of India in collaboration with Society of Ethnobotanists. At the outset, I would like to thank you all for taking time out and being here today to join this webinar. Today marks the first death anniversary of late Dr. S.K. Jain the father of Indian ethnobotany. This webinar is organized in the memory of most respected Dr. S.K. Jain to pay tribute to him and to remember his huge contributions in the field of ethnobotany in India. Dr. S.K. Jain joined the Botanical Survey of India at the Western Regional Center Pune as systematic botanist in the year 1956 and served up to 1960. Then he was transferred to BSI Allahabad and posted as economic botanist as per the recommendation of late Dr. E.K. Janaki Amman, who was revising the mandate of the Botanical Survey of India during that period. She was the precursor to assign Dr. Jain to carry out the research on ethnobotany. It is because of Dr. S.K. Jain the ethnobotanical studies in India came into limelight and got a recognition as a core scientific discipline in universities and research institutions. He was influential in rapid advancement of ethnobotanical research and has made a worldwide impact on India's leadership in this subject. One of his famous books, The Dictionary of Indian Folk Medicine and Ethnobotany, was used as evidence in US courts and helped India to win the case during the turmeric patent case in the United States. So today's tribute will surely bring more awareness on conserving as well as the importance of documenting the traditional knowledge and ethnobotany for the well-being of the society. As every one of you know that our country is rich in biodiversity and also rich in associated traditional knowledge, which is ancient and long established. Many of the traditional knowledge are documented and whereas several others are passing from one generation to the next verbally undocumented and as folklore knowledge. In fact, the search for medicinal plants gave rise to one of the oldest branch of science, the botany, and plant taxonomy originated in the prehistory as herbalism with efforts of human beings to identify, classify, and later cultivate the edible, medicinal, and poisonous plants. Even to date, in our day-to-day -day life, there is a major awareness about the herbal medicines and herbal products. Right from the healthcare products, herbal cosmetics, herbal cleaning products, health drinks, immunity boosters and whatnot. Herbal plant usage is rapidly gaining momentum among the general public. In recent times, we have witnessed the COVID-19 and were effective in combating the pandemic by the routine use of many immunomodulator medicinal plants and traditional Ayush formulations by the Indian people. So the ethnobotanical databases form one of the prime sources of information for plant-based drug discovery programs and herbal drug development by many research and development organizations. Documentation of ethnobotanical and traditional knowledge is not only important for its effectiveness, but also for the benefit sharing with the knowledge holders. You all must be aware that the Biological Diversity Act 2002 is enacted by the Parliament of India for the preservation of biological diversity in India and provides mechanism for equitable sharing of benefits arising out of the use of traditional biological resources and knowledge with the local communities. 
Hence, the documentation of such traditional knowledge is essential for safeguarding the traditional knowledge and also prevention of biopiracy. In these circumstances, people's biodiversity registers or the PBRs are considered as the most important basic records of a region's biological resources like plants, animals, and the traditional knowledge of the local people. So we are profusely happy that we have today our respected director, Dr. A. A. Mao, Botanical Survey of India, to deliver the inaugural address. We have esteemed dignitaries and distinguished guests who have given their valuable time to join this webinar. We have with us Dr. A. K. Goyal, Vice President, Society of Ethnobotanists from Lucknow, who will highlight about the Society of Ethnobotanists. Professor Rainer Busman, Department of Ethnobotany, Institute of Botany and School of Natural Sciences and Medicine from Georgia, will deliver his keynote lecture on the COVID-19 pandemic, chance or detriment for ethnobiological research and international collaboration, and followed by another keynote lecture by Dr. Arvind Saklani, Vice President, Sami Savinsa Group from Bangalore, on the relevance of ethnobotany in India, retrospect and prospects. So we all are eagerly waiting for your talks, sir, and we are sure that today's webinar will be helpful and beneficial to our participants. I'm happy to share that we have got a very good response to this webinar. There are almost 500 registrations for today's webinar from across 29 states and union territories. This webinar is also available live streaming in YouTube for the participants. If anyone wants to interact with the resource persons or having any queries, you can use the chat box. You're also welcome to give your feedback, which will help us a lot in organizing our future programs. So this is all about today's program. I thank you all once again, and I hope everyone will make it as a good opportunity to listen and gain knowledge from the learner experienced resource person. Thank you. Madam, for your kind words. Now, I would like to request Dr. A. Mao, Director, Botanical Survey of India, to speak a few words and increase the occasion of a national webinar. Good morning, everyone. Am I audible? Ah, okay. It's a great honor and privilege for me to address this today's webinar. I'm really happy that we have a lot of eminent people who have joined today for the special webinar on the first date anniversary of our founding father of Indian ethnobotany, that is Dr. S.K. Jain who is known as the, uh, the father of Indian ethnobotany. So uh, in remembrance of him, we have organized this webinar, one day webinar. And I'm very happy that the party, uh, there's a lot of response from all over the country and from across some other country, uh, parts of the world also. And also I'm thankful to Dr. Rainer Busman and Dr. Arvind Saklani for giving their time to give the talk in spite of the short notice. Thank you so much. So respected uh, colleagues, friends, and all the students who have joined today, it's a great honor for me to address this webinar in the inaugural section. You see, we all know India is one of the mega biodiversity rich country in the world. And also at the same time, India is one of the perfect example of one of the oldest civilization where use of plant and other uh, natural products for healthcare system. That is, uh, we all know about uh, that. So, and also in India, they also, about 65% of the population use Ayurveda and medicinal plants for treating this healthcare, healthcare system. And also this, even 
the world health organization also has uh, reported or estimated that about 18 percent of 80 percent of the population in developing countries relies on traditional medicine so that is why this is very important i know you see when we look back to our uh, to our country context indian context you see the society of ethnobotany started now almost about 40 years ago in the 80s it started and today is uh, the 2022 so what have we achieved what have we done i think we should also look back into it on this uh, today's occasion of this our first date anniversary of our founding father the pro sgj and so and that has reintrospect ourselves and see what have we done and what we have we achieved. India is celebrating this uh, seven, 75 years of independence of that uh, Azadika Amrit Mahatso. And on this uh, occasion, the government of India also is asking from everyone, especially from scientific uh, institution, what is your contribution? What progress you have done? in your different fields. So as a society of this ethnobotany, we also should look into it or reintrospect ourselves. What our society has so far made or contributed to the uh, to this uh, tradition or this traditional knowledge. Whether we have only documented or from our documentation, whether any progress has been made or any achievement has been made or any breakthrough has been made. Otherwise, you see, if we look at the data, in ancient this Vedic period, that is from uh, 3000 to 1000 BC, 289 medicinal plants were used. And then also in, uh, uh, this, uh, in the Samhita period, about 650 medicinal plants were used, and that is recorded from that is 1500 to 580 BC to 580. Then again, in this, uh, if you see the Nigun Nigun to period, 580 to oh, 1980, about 1014 medicinal plants have been record, uh, documented. And so you see, our country is rich uh, and rich in. Ayurveda, Yunani, and Siddha, uh, these are what some of the well-known examples of medicine, uh, this uh, uh, practices which in our country. But uh, you see, in recent days, based on our documentation by various groups, both ethnobotany as well as, as well as others, India has recorded about or estimated about 7,000 263 in uh, plant used as medicinal uh, record or uh, medicinal. So, uh, but out of this, 960 species are treated, and the most treated ones are only 178 species are treated, highly treated. So, if we look at this statistic, also only very few has been exploited or, or used. So there's a lot of scope for utilization of this medicinal plant because we have recorded around almost 8,000 species, but still we have not even used about 1,000 or so properly yet. So that is why there's a lot of potential and there are a lot of scope for this in this area of uh, science. So we have a lot of role to play what I feel is that in our this Indian ethnobotany, we need to relook really into it because in most of the documentation what we have, it is not properly documented to my view. That is my own uh, view. So what happened is that we have just simply most of the time listed the name of the plan and just listed such as used for fever, for uh, uh, stomach pain, or for this, that, just like that. And there's no proper dosage, no proper uh, documentation. 
So that is one of the uh, loophole in this uh, ethnobotany. Then, uh, because you, as you all are aware, or you know, this in this uh, allopathy, they are very systematic, and the document or the doctors will prescribe every day. Take one morning, um, one tablet in the morning after food. Then after in the uh, in the evening before going to bed or something like that, they always prescribe in the proper way. But in our documentation of ethnobotany, most of these two, uh, uh, researchers don't recommend, uh, uh, document such thing. So they just simply say it is used for fever to to uh, to relieve fever or to uh, uh, to I mean for dysentery or for anything like that. So that has no meaning and it becomes so uh, no, not scientific at all. So that's why we need to look into it. And also, as a researcher, we need to study the cross-cultural ethnobotany and analyze what are the most important medicinal plants in this uh, 7,000 or so or documented for, by our, from our country. Otherwise, I think uh, whatever we are doing, it's not, it is not uh, having any impact. That is why my uh, request to my fellow uh, ethnobotanists is that in the coming year, let us be more systematic, let us uh, do it in such a way so that our research become, our work become like a scientific research. Otherwise, many people, what they say is that ethnobotany is not science. It is anybody can do it. Anybody can record it. Even a non-science uh, scientist or non-science student can do it. That is what they start uh, comparing and they start telling that uh, uh, ethnobotany is not a science. I don't. Uh, I don't agree with that. We should make it a science. Otherwise, yes, it is not a science. If we are the way what we are doing, just documenting. Anybody can document the, what we are doing, and then. Not only documented, but I think we should look into the by prospecting of that, of the medicinal plant. So it is high time for all of us to collaborate with all the different disciplines in the science, biochemistry, phytochemistry, then uh, molecular, and then pharmaceutical. Uh, all has to come together and work together. Then we can make a progress and we can see the results. And we can get benefit from the huge number of medicinal plants recorded from our country. Otherwise, what is happening is our country is going to be only boasting that we are very rich in biodiversity, we are very rich in medicinal plants, but we are not getting any benefit. You see today, according to the record data, there are more than 8,500 manufacturers of Ayurvedic drugs in the country. And then, you see, that's a lot. But then also, if you look at this uh, thing, the plant use is mostly 178 species only, not the 7,000 plus uh, plants of the country. And then also, most of these are, again, about 15% of the medicinal plant use are only cultivated. The rays are co uh, collected from the wild. And this is a really grievous situation, really uh, serious situation. We have to think of it. Or if we allow to continue, the rich resources of our country will be, uh, I mean, it will it will be, I mean, it will be exploited and will uh, will not have these uh, plants and resources in the uh, in the forest. So it needs to be brought under cultivation all the medicinal plants using through this agro uh, by developing agro techniques and all those things so that they can be cultivated and harvested for medicinal plant purpose. Otherwise, based on the statistic about 85% is still collected from the wild, which is really very serious situation and we should think of it. As, uh, as researchers, we all should consider all these things.
So uh, I'm sure today's webinar is uh, the two speakers, uh, this uh, Dr. Rainer Wiesman and Dr. Saklani will throw light on the different aspect of this issue of uh, how it uh, botany can play a role and how we should go about it. So I'm sure this all of us will benefit from this tune, uh, from this webinar. And in future, based on this uh, webinar, we can plan out further action and we can check out what we can do. And I feel that uh, that uh, we should organize uh, in, in, in the coming year one international seminar or national seminar to conference of ethnobotany. So um, we are planning from botanical survey of India side, we, uh, we can take up this thing. So hopefully, based on this outcome, we can make some, uh, take some uh, way forward action and uh, uh, plan for it. So thank you once again. Thank you everyone for giving me this opportunity to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your valuable words. Uh, now I'd like to inform all that our guest of today's webinar, Dr. Arvind Patlani, Vice President, Sami Sabinsa Group, is uh, busy at a meeting with our Honorable Prime Minister at Bangalore, so he will be joining us very soon. Now I would like to request Dr. A.K. Goel, Vice President, Society of Ethnobotanists, let know to speak a few words about the Society of Ethnobotanists and about Dr. S. A. J. Namaskar, a very good uh, morning to all the participants. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Mao, the Director BSI and the President of Society of Ethnobotanists for taking this uh, initiative to organize this one day webinar in collaboration with the Society of Ethnobotanists. You see, we look at the genesis of this ethnobotany. When I met for the first time in, I think, 1978, when Dr. Jain visited uh, the national, uh, this uh, BSI Northern Circle, the first question he asked to me that what is ethnobotany? At that time, ethnobotany was entirely new for me. I heard for the first time this term from him. So I said to him that I don't know anything about ethnobotany. Then within one minute, I was very clear what ethno ethnobotany is that he explained to me. As I have been told now to speak uh, about the society of ethnobotanists. You see, the ethnobotany has attracted worldwide attention during the last seven decades and has established the close linkages with many subjects like botany, economic botany, conservation, medicinal plants, pharmacology, drug research, development, as well as agriculture. If uh, I will not be wrong if I say that ethnobotany is the mother of all for the promotion of multifarious potentialities and prospects as uh, Dr. Mao right now emphasized on the aspects of ethnobotany an international scientific body, the Society of Ethnobotanists was founded on 26th November 1980 under the presidentship of late Dr. S.K. Jain, FNA, the then director of the Botanical Survey of India and the founder president of Society of Ethnobotanists. Dr. N.C. Shah was the founder secretary of this society at that time, he was based at Central Institute of Medicinal and Over Aromatic Plants. This Society of Ethnobotanists had the main objectives of the society as below to promote the cause of ethnobotany and related sciences in all the aspects and manners, to encourage collaboration and collection and preservation of information through folklore and ancient resources about various uses of plants for posterity 
and to integrate researches in interdisciplinary fields like phytochemistry, pharmacognosy, pharmacology, traditional system of medicine, agriculture, horticulture, and forestry. To create awareness about the dwindling resources from the natural environment and vanishing ethnobotanical and folklore data, as well as the digitization of the ethnobotanical knowledge to procure the funds for meeting the objects. You see, at present, we had the honorary fellows also in our society. Like uh, the first honorary fellow was Dr. Professor Ari Schultz, then Professor Sir G. T. Prince, Dr. S. K. J. Late Dr. S. K. Jain, and uh, in the year 2018, uh, Dr. M. S. Swaminathan was also our honorary member. The present executive council, Dr. Mao is the president, myself vice president at headquarter, Dr. Bhogankar, vice president, Dr. N.K. Dhal, vice president, Dr. Rani Prakash from Natural History Museum, London, vice president. Besides this, our editorial board, Dr. D.K. Singh, present in this meeting also, is our chief editor of the journal. Dr. Sunil Srivastava is the editor. Doc managing editor is Dr. Lalbi Chaudhary. You see, we have uh, organized several seminars during the past this uh, 43 years of long span. We organized several training courses. International seminar was organized at, at NBRI in 1994. That was a big success in the collaboration of International Society of Ethnobiology. You see, for the promotion of the ethnobotany and to increase the R&D studies on this very important aspect, the Society of Ethnobotanists established medal awards in the first instance. The Society established two medal awards in the beginning from 1992 with the help of the generous donation by some life members, particularly Dr. H. Fujiwara of Japan. These medals were named after J.W. Hushwarger, who first coined the term ethnobotany in 1895, and Dr. E.K. Janki Amal, who first initiated and promoted organized studies of ethnobotany in India in the middle of 20th century. Dr. E.K. Janki Amal medal, it was installed in 1992, and it is awarded to a senior and active ethnobotanist for long and distinguished services, research, and promotion of ethnobotany. Open, it is open to all the countries, preferably for women workers. It is given to all senior and active researchers in the field of ethnobotany from the developed nations. The first recipient was Dr. R. E. Schultz in 1992. And in the year 2020, Professor D. A. Patil from Dhule. J. W. Harshwarger medal was also installed in 1992 for a senior and active ethnobotanist for long and distinguished services, research and promotion of ethnobotany. It is open to all the countries. It was meant for the active and senior ethnobotanists from developing nations prior to 2019. The first recipient was Dr. S. K. Jain, followed by Dr. Pei Shengji from China. And this year it was given to Dr. N.K. Dhal from Bhubaneswar. Dr. S.K. Jain medal was installed in 1998 for a senior and matured active ethnobotanist below 55 years. Only the postdoctoral research work supported with excellent publications has to be considered for this medal. The first recipient was Professor S.K. Barthakur and myself. And this year it has been, uh, in the year 2020, it has been given to Dr. Veena Satya. You see, all these medals we award every alternate year. One more medal was added, Dr. B. N. Marutra medal, installed by his family members. He expired in the October 2005. He was in CDRI and had a great love for ethnobotany. So this medal was installed in the year 2006 for a botanist who has made notable contributions in the capacity building developing a national facility in the field of botany, research work in plant taxonomy and ethnobotany with particular emphasis on medicinal plants. 
in the year 2006 professor sk barthakur was given this award followed by dr arvind saklani and uh, dr sikarwar is here 2016 dr sikarwar was given this award and uh, in the year 2020 dr sanjeev kumar oja has been given this award another medal we have is dr dc pal medal it was installed in the year 2011 dr dc pal was a great ethnobotanist working in odisha and west bengal and uh, he gave the donation for this award or medal for a young and active ethnobotanist below 40 years of age you see the first recipient was dr anita jain and uh, this year in the year 2020 dr pankaj a dhole kolkata and dr vijay wag from nbri lucknow has been given this medal professor p sen sharma medal was installed in the year 2014 for a scholar working on scriptures and sacred plants as well as the sacred groups the first recipient uh, of this award uh, medal was to, in the year 2014 dr aparna avasti followed by dr vartika jain and uh, uh, in the year 2020 we could not find any suitable candidate for this you see the S sk jain award for the best phd thesis in ethnobotany it was installed in the year 2014 by the generous help and donation from dr paramjit singh in the memory of his late mother for the indian candidate whose duration of award date of notification for phd degree from any ugc approved university in the field of ethnobotany dr madhmita nath from assam university was the first recipient and this year from vishwabharati university dr sagari choudhary from kolkata has been given this award besides this for youngsters to encourage the youngsters under the single authorship papers for our journal ethnobotany silver jubilee best paper award was uh, started when we start published the 25th volume the award has been established for the journal the award is confined to the authors of the papers in this journal and the scientists associated with the journal after the publication of 25th volume the first uh, uh, award was given to dr roma mitra who worked as a editor for a very long period as well as for the best paper dr h ram lingova from mizoram and uh, in the year 2020 this award has gone to dr kumar avinash bharti from bsi kolkata besides that as you know that uh, any society is visible with its journal so dr jain took the initiative and we started publication international journal of ethnobotany named as ethnobotany from 1989 from 1989 very long journey we have uninterruptedly published till 19 Uh, to 2019 31 volumes it is an international journal brought out regularly by the society of ethnobotanists since 1989 you see this is very very important besides this we have the fellowship of the society fes as well as the now last year we started the local chapters like kerala chapter tamil nadu chapter goa chapter and jnk chapter goa chapter and jnk chapter this is we started in 2021 kerala chapter and tamil nadu chapter was started in 2020 so this is all about the society and besides that society has published about more than 10 books except this uh, journal so we look forward further for uh, mean your feedbacks and uh, uh, now we will be starting Uh, our e-journal because till the volume 31st we were having this hard copies but now from this onwards we will be bringing our e-journal and uh, this volume will be coming as a to give the tributes to dr sk jain this volume will be uh, given uh, as a as a commemorative volume uh, for dr jain by the society of the bodies thank you thank you once again for giving me the opportunity to make to tell you something about Uh, it's not working thank you very much thank you 
you, sir, for your inspiring words mm -hmm. and it was your wonderful time. Uh, sir, there is a question from Razia Parvin on how to become a member in the Society of Ethnobotanists. So please, if you can elaborate on this. You see, there's uh, for membership. You can see our website and uh, uh, our www society of ethnobotanists, and uh, you can download the form membership form. Uh, ordinary membership is annual membership is rupees five hundred, and uh, life membership is uh, uh, five thousand rupees. For the students, it can be paid in one calendar year in installments also, or at one time also. And if you can, uh, sh sh you can note down my uh, mobile number, nine four one five zero two five two four five. I will send you the form immediately, and online uh, you can deposit the membership fee also on online. I think now it is clear to you, and all the privileges for the members already <coughs> I have told you uh, in my presentation about the Society of Ethnobotanists. Those okay, who those who become uh, want to become the member of the society they can see go through the website and see all the activities of the society thank you once again thank you sir for your valuable work and your valuable time uh, now we uh, i want to inform you all that we have facilitated all our participants and dignitaries registered on this webinar with Google Meeting link, but uh, that is limited to 100 participants only. So those who could not uh, uh, were not able to join this webinar uh, through the Google Meet link are requested to join the YouTube live streaming that is going on in YouTube. Now, I would like to introduce Dr. R. W. Guzman. Professor of Ethnobotany and Health, Department of Ethnobotany, Institute of Botany and School of Natural Sciences and Medicine, India State University, Tbilisi, Georgia. Before moving to Georgia, Dr. Guzman served as the director of William L. Brown Center at Missouri Botanical Garden. He holds affiliate appointments and serves as an external advisor at universities worldwide. His work focuses on ethnobotanical research and the preservation of traditional knowledge in the Andes, Caucasus, and the Himalayas. Dr. Busman has authored over 330 peer-reviewed papers and over 1,200 peer-reviewed book chapters and authored or edited 38 books. According to the Stanford University, he is one of the most cited ethnobotanists and recognized among the 2% most influential scientists worldwide. Dr. Busman is the past president of the Society for the Economic Botany and has served as a board or founder of the International Society for Ethnopharmacology, Society of Ethnobiology, Botanical Society of America, and International Society of Ethnobiology. Now, I would like to request Dr. Busman to present his lead lecture. Good morning, everybody, and many thanks for the kind introduction. Can you hear me all? Excellent. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is, um, yes, sir. Wonderful. It is a great honor to be here today with you, and uh, especially on the occasion of the first death anniversary of uh, Dr. S.K. Chain, who not only is the father of Indian ethnobotany, but you could say is one of the main fathers of ethnobotany around the globe. And the fact that the Society of Ethnobotanists has been active so long as actually the only society dedicated on ethnobotany as such um, is a great um, show of importance of him and the science in India. And I also would like to, to comment that, of course, India is a very fortunate country having a botanical survey that has been active uh, for so long and has been maintained, while many other countries short-sightedly have shut down botanical 
uh, expertise because they thought botany would not be of broad interest. The current pandemic has shown that this is, of course, absolutely not the case. Botany is a very important science. And I will get into uh, this now. One second, I hope this opens. For some reason, my, my screen is not showing. Okay, here we go. Well, for some reason, does it, it does not allow to share my screen. I will, I will keep on talking. One, one second, we have a technical problem, it seems. While we solve this problem, you might have seen that uh, the Society of Economic Botany in the United States has decided uh, to trying to rename itself Society for Economic Botany. So you might actually take this into account uh, when, when you think about the name of the Society for Ethnobotanists, because in fact, it is the Society for Ethnobotany per se. So you might actually say Society for Ethnobotanists slash Society for Ethnobotany, because simply speaking, you are the most important society on the, on the globe when it comes to our science. So now I hope we, we have managed to solve. Oh, we, we still we still have some screen sharing problems. So I, I will just give give my talk without sharing the screen because something something does not seem to work. Um, so the COVID pandemic has shown that uh, it can actually be an interesting uh, starter for international collaboration. And the reason that we're here is one of that. However, being ethnobotanists, of course, we always like to meet in person. So 
the fact that we have to have online meetings is also a detriment for our research. So what is one of the problems of the pandemic? It's the widespread use of traditional or what is called traditional medicinal plants to treat COVID. And of course, these are plants based on teas, beverages, foods um, that have long been, been called traditional medicines. And it's frequently the initial health response in times of uncertainty when public health is under pressure. And such different types of domestic preparations are mostly those formally known to cope with flu or other respiratory illnesses and for boosting the immune system. It's homemade remedies that have widely been popularized via the internet and social media, but mostly, and Dr. Mao has already uh, spoken about that, without any indication of efficacy. Folk remedies urgently need thus to be evaluated within the context of pandemic, especially for bioactivity and pharmacological properties, whether it's immunomodulators, anti-flu or cough relieving, relieving agents, and are, however, important to maintain resilience in times of crisis. And communities need to stay properly informed by government agencies, public spokespeople, and media who should collaborate closely with the scientific community to communicate updates clearly and unambiguously. And when we look at which taxa were most commonly used for COVID treatments, we see things like Singibra officinale, Allium sativum, Allium sepa, Cucuma longa, and so on. It is all very well known aromatic and spice plants that have a very long use history, but none of them have been proven to work as remedy against uh, coronavirus. They're all immunomodulants and so on and so on. And in fact, the immunomodulatory activity of many of them have been shown. And in some cases, antiviral function has also shown. So they are essentially antiviral food plants. And we do very well know that traditionally plants with use in communities do actually have efficacy. We have shown that widely in our studies in Peru, where we tested a huge number of medicinal plants, indicating that almost all plants that had traditional uses, for example, as antibacterials, in effect, had efficacy. Of course, we also showed that many of these species are in fact toxic. We found, for example, that 24% of all aqueous extracts had toxicity and 76% of all ethanol extracts also had pretty high toxicity, which of course is taken into account by local practitioners because toxicity levels are influenced by origin and harvest time. So solvent and application style do try to avoid side effects. Example, most internally consumed medicinal species are used in aqueous extracts and the ethanol extracts are normally used topically. The problem we are running into, however, is widespread species replacement. In many countries, um, people, collectors, users, know medicinal species simply by vernacular names. And this, of course, can very easily lead to problems. Very simple example we found in Bolivia, uh, Equisetum giganteum and Bogotense horse tails are traditionally used for problems of urinary systems. And because of white development that has destroyed wetlands, now people use ephedra for the same purpose and have assigned the same vernacular name to ephedra. And this, of course, is a very big problem because ephedra causes urinary system problems. And this is, of course, where we all come in as botanists because the correct identification of botanicals is the broadest need that we really have. And it's a huge problem because in many studies, we of course see that, that especially students are not very versed in plant taxonomy. 
and thus it will just report local names, which uh, does at the end not tell us anything about the real identity of the plants, or they do not report any scientific names, or they simply report the wrong scientific names. So this indeed is absolutely a huge problem that we do have to address. And of course, the Botanical Survey of India has always been very good of doing that. And it's a great pleasure to see that this is continuing. And this plant misidentification is also a huge problem in public health systems and has been aggravated during the pandemic. For example, in one study we did in Peru, the public health system is prescribing some 25 different uh, botanicals for a variety of diseases. And at least 30% of them are simply labeled wrong. One example is uh, they, are, they are selling Berberis vulgaris in theory, but the plant in the package is actually Valesia glabra, which is in Apocinaceae. So it's even different families that are being sold. And this is ongoing and of course a high problem for the users because they don't know whether the system that the public, the plant, the public health system prescribes is actually uh, working in any way or not. And what is the solution? The solution, of course, is to collect and collect and identify material. This is really uh, the most important part we have to stay into. And as Dr. Mao said, botany is a very, very important science. And we have to see that we train and employ more botanists. And if you look at ethnobotanical publications, you see a very wide variety of publications that simply use wrong names all over the place. <coughs> Either wrong epithets, plant authors are frequently missing. So in many cases, if we compare publications, it's extremely hard to know what the authors are actually talking about. One criticism that as botanists we get sometimes from our colleagues, especially in, in anthropology, is that how can we work with plant names if taxonomy is changing all the time? And we did a very small sideline study uh, trying to elucidate the differences in the most important ethnobotanically important plant family in Peru based on APG 2, 3, and 4. And actually found that the plant family sequence that is the most important plant families almost did not change at all when we used the different APG systems. So it is actually beneficial to constantly update botanical taxonomy also in the field of ethnobotany to make sure that at a global scale we know what we're talking about. Because the modern taxonomy also nicely reflects plant use. That is to say that uh, families that are not recognized as very important, for example, Milvaceae, have now made it into the most important plant families because of botanical taxonomy revisions, because now Milvaceae, as you all know, contains also what was previously in, in um, T Tiliac and Sterculiac and Bombacaceae and so on. So modern taxonomy actually reflects traditional knowledge in this case. Another huge problem in the pandemic has been access and protection of local indigenous communities because of course we do have to talk to people to document traditional knowledge. And during the pandemic, it has almost, almost been impossible to access those communities, uh, especially because we have to make sure that very virus susceptible local community members are well protected. And this also relates to the Nagoya protocol on access and 
access to genetic resources and fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from their utilization, which of course is enforced in India. And as goals has the fair and equitable share sharing of benefits arising from utilization of resources, appropriate access to resources, transfer of technology, funding to contribute to conservation of biological diversity and sustainable use. And of course, that traditional knowledge is only accessed with prior and informed consent, approval and involvement of indigenous and local communities only after mutually agreed terms have been established. And from our perspective, this kind of benefit sharing must also include the repatriation of new data in the language and form accessible to the traditional owners. And it must include translation and repatriation of results of previous studies conducted in the same communities, because we all know many international researchers especially have conducted ethnobotanical studies, but they have never given back the result to local communities, or they have given it back in a form that the communities cannot understand. Local counterparts should also, from our perspective, be allowed full participation as, for example, authors in studies rather than simply being mentioned as a sideline in acknowledgments, and I will explain this a little bit later because this is always an interesting matter of discussion. The problems we are running into with the Nagoya Protocol and sharing of results are, of course, multifaceted. One of them is that many um, sharing entities, for example, global plants in JSTOR, require that you subscribe to their service or that you are in your institution to have access. Um, nice example is uh, for me always that one of the plants I described uh, is uh, type now on global plants in JSTOR, but I can't access it unless I am uh, in my university or in another network that has access to JSTOR. And I think this is, of course, not correct. And we believe that in publications, uh, local scientists and local counterparts must participate, not only in acknowledgments, but in general. And now give me, give me one minute, I think, um, I'll be right back. Uh, we, we, I think, have, have found a way to, to solve finally this screen problem. So please bear with me and excuse me for one second. Yeah, it's all right, sir. So I have to get out one second, and then I think we can organize this. Now you see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. And you can hear me. Yes, sir. Wonderful. So one solution uh, that addresses both problems, one, access to local communities, and also make sure the Nagoya protocol is well implemented, is simply training local researchers. <laughs> and we did that with a community in Bolivia. The Chacopo community. Yes? So your screen is not visible to us. Oh, the screen is not visible. Sir, it is visible, but it is not full screen. Ah, oh, but it's okay. Uh, it's it's hard. Let me see whether whether we can do full screen. Spotlight already. Spotlight. Yes, sir. Does it work now? Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, the, the, the Chacopo community is, is, a, is a tribe of, of Pano speakers. So it's very few tribal members. They were nomadic and have settled in the 1960s. They have been visited by anthropologists for 100 years. And there have been a bunch of ethnobotanical studies since 1986, which makes for an interesting timeline because it allows us to assess how knowledge has changed over a hundred years and how the training of 
the investigators actually influences the study. So obviously, lives have changed a lot in the in the last 100 years. Uh, here are a couple of pictures. People have, have changed to modern attire and so on. So big question, of course, was always, uh, did traditional knowledge actually get lost or not? And if you look at hunting weapons, of course, you see previously people used arrows, now they use guns. And it seemed that a lot of uh, agricultural diversity disappeared over the last 100 years. So we started this Jacopo Ethnobotany project trying to train local investigators for two reasons. One, uh, to see whether we can get more data, especially also under scenario where trained scientists cannot have access, like now in the pandemic. And we also wanted to prove or disprove whether local scientists actually could get good data. Um, as we pointed out in the introduction, some who see ethnobotany not as a science because everybody can document traditional knowledge. And in fact, we did want to show that even people without university education can do that. However, of course, then we still have to analyze the data. So this is first of all about getting the information. So what, we, what did we do? We trained 12 local ethnobotanists. And mind, these were local teachers. So all of them um, were fluent in national language and in the local language. And of course, they could read and write and use technology. And these okay. guys managed to get your almost 30,000. Your slide is Sorry? not moving. Your slide is not, not moving. You it are... is not moving. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now, thank you. Okay, now, now we'll, we'll do it that way. And these guys actually managed to end interview the entire tribe. And I think it's the first time in the world that one an entire tribe has been uh, interviewed. It has never happened before. It's a very good example. And we actually got very interesting results. For example, we always ask what is used for what purpose. And it was very clear that specific plant families had specific uses, especially in medicine. As you can say, see some especially smaller families, Ciparunaceae, Proteaceae, Polygonaceae, were the ones that had a lot of medicinal uses. So this was a very interesting focused result. And we actually saw that there was a larger variation inside communities than between communities. And very obviously, knowledge was very widespread around the tribe. But then within different villages, uh, there were bigger differences between individual people. We also found that women knew more than men. And this is not only about medicine, this is about all plant use, which is, of course, also an interesting result because very frequently we, we believe at the beginning of studies that it's more men that are responsible knowledge holders. We also found that older participants knew more. Uh, this is not a surprise. This is what studies normally assume. However, when you look at these red arrows, you see one generation. These were the people between 50 and 60 that were actually least knowledgeable. And to explain that, we had to know, know history because when these people were youngsters, American missionaries came to the village and prohibited plant use so they could not learn which is why they, they knew less than youngsters nowadays. But it also shows that knowledge can be recovered because as soon as plant use was allowed again, the youngsters started studying and kept knowledge alive. Very interesting in this context was that we had a very huge uh, informant consensus in, in essence, everybody knew everything. And you see that we have a very nice informant distribution, uh, same, same number of people in all genders and also all age classes. But everybody had a very widely distributed knowledge, which is an interesting result in this study. And I like to get a little bit more into indices because uh, nowadays we say modern ethnobotany has to use a lot of indices. Um, and I always say this is yes and no as a good part of science. 
when we look at informant consensus, we really saw that community was the most important factor influencing it. Um, this is very clear. If a community lives in a dense forest, they will have a different knowledge than say the ones living in a savanna. So this, this was very clear. Well, age, gender, ethnicity had not much of an influence. But as you know, in many ethnobotanical studies, you see a variety of indices being used to elucidate which plants are the most important ones. And all of these indices originally come out of ecology. So we, we already should be very careful in their use because they're not, not always easily applicable uh, to studies related to people. And all of them give us, give us different results. So if you look at the most important plants, uh, the red ones are always palms. Uh, we see that five species or six species have the highest diversity of uses. One of them is Euterpe precatoria, one of the palms. But if we use, look at the use value, the species that are most valuable to the local community, it's a whole different group of species and a whole different group of palms, which also means that one index alone cannot give us uh, the most important plant species in such an ethnobotanical setting, which means if we want to use one index, for example, to elucidate conservation priorities, we will most definitely go wrong. Which means that if we do quantitative statistics, uh, we need to use a variety of indices to in fact get a good idea about what we're talking about. And here we get into the interviewer effect. Now, who should then do these ethnobotanical studies? Is it important who, do, who does interviews or not? And as we know from economy, interviewers normally do influence the responses of interviewed people. And as you can say here, normally all the interviewed people cluster around their interviewer. So there is definitely some effect. And first of all, we asked, uh, do the number of plants and uses that an interviewer gets from participants differ between different interviewers? And they do. However, the gray people in this slide are the trainers. So the gray people are us, and the white squares are the trained local teachers. And you can see that many of them actually, at the end, were so well trained that they got results very similar to what we had got in interviews. So we can say, yes, we can train tribes people to become good uh, para, let's say para ethnobotanists. They can get good data that we then can start interpreted, imper interpreting. The advantage of course, is that they have much more time. They are there all the time and they can talk to everybody, which gives us a huge amount of good data. Well, one question, of course, is if an interviewer themselves has a high knowledge, will they get more information from interviewed participants than interviewers who have little knowledge? And in this case, the answer is no. This person was a youngster who had very uh, no, this, this, very little knowledge. This was an old guy interviewing who had a lot of knowledge. And it turns out that the youngster actually was so eager to do interviews that they get more species and uses than their, their older counterparts. But do all interviewers report at least some new information, although they themselves have, new, have a lot of knowledge, or are they simply reiterating what they know? And the reality is, all the interviewers, whether they were experienced or not, got at least 50% new species and uses as compared to their own use. So interview knowledge actually does not matter. What matter is the, matters is the enthusiasm of the interviewers. Same, same thing here. This was the most knowledgeable guy and he still got 50% more. This was a youngster who had less knowledge and he they get up got almost 70% more. So doing interviews also was a way to spread that knowledge. And one very important question that we have to ask in our interviews is what method should we apply? Structured interviews or free listing? Now, structured interviews 
always very nice if we talk about very little so say one plant family or one medical application but if we're in biodiverse countries like india with thousands of species it is absolutely impossible to do structured ethnobotanical interviews and talk about every single species so automatically we will, we will have to get into a free listing exercise so which species are used for uh, treating heart conditions for example and our question was uh, if we have to do that how does it compare if we actually do both for one plant group structured interviews and free listing and how many participants do we actually need in a study so uh, we, en we entered uses of palms in a focus study in a free list exercise so the focus study was asking information about every single palm in a region and every single part of that plant in the free listing study simply was uh, very typical ethnobotanically what are you using for uh, building what are you using for medicine and so on so the focus study contained 87 participants which would be about here and if you look at the number of participants we needed in the free list study to get the same number of species mentioned we got to 300 almost so if we do free listing we need many many more participants to get the same results and when it came to uses not even the whole number of participants in free listing managed to give us all the uses that we had in a specific study and this is very important because we know that many ethnobotanical studies have how many 20 30 40 participants and if they use those for free listing they will not get good results absolutely not so another outcome of this was that a focus study would report a complete different set of species as important as in comparison to the free list study so all this essentially were species that were not regarded as important when we did a specific study and they came out in free list so you see both types of studies have a very important advantage and fortunately uh, in our work we could actually do repeat interviews so some of the 87 people we interviewed in a specific study were also interviewed in a free list study and some of the free list participants were interviewed twice and as you can see here their answers were often completely apart so if i interview somebody two times that person might give me two completely different sets of species in both interviews this might not be too surprising however at least we thought that people who had previously participated participated in the specific study would give us the same information and that was not the case so these were the, the responses in the very specific palm study and these were the responses in the freely study so you see that even the people who had research experience or interview experience gave us much less information when they were only participating in free listing so this is is a, a huge problem of course and is another reason why we need long-term studies ethnobotanical studies that only last a few days or a few weeks will not give us all the information we need and this is where training of researchers comes in because i told you there were anthropological and botanical studies for 100 years and you see that all the anthropologists who reported on plant species reported on very very few species the pure botanists reported on more species but they included a lot of species that had no uses and our local ethnobotanists the local teachers doing interviews they actually found most of the species but more uses and more detailed information on, on parts used and this also goes in the direction that uh, Dr. Mao pointed out. We need interviews that give us more detail on what plants are used, what parts are used, what preparation methods are used, and what dosages are there. 
so that we can really uh, make most of these ethnobotanical data. But uh, overall, the blue circle is the study of the local ethnobotanists. The local ethnobotanists, in essence, found everything that had been found in the last hundred years, even things that had been missed by trained botanists because sim they simply did not ask the right questions. So any perception of knowledge loss in that community was actually an effect of a not well-structured study. What we also found is that people got back to their nomadic habits, although they have some central villages, but they use many parts of their territory for different purposes, which is, of course, very common if traditional people have access to uh, larger areas that they occupied before. And I mentioned the fact that uh, we thought that maybe hunting arrows had disappeared, but as you can see below, all these are still there. They were just not found by previous researchers. Same for crop diversity. Uh, crop diversity is still there, but the botanists had not explicitly asked about crops. And for that reason, missed that part. And here is one important aspect of such studies. And this is a return of traditional knowledge, especially when we talk about the Nagoya Protocol, because as we know, the Nagoya Protocol explicitly gives the right to knowledge to the local communities, and of course, the right of genetic resources to the central government. So returning this information in an appropriate way is extremely important in a way that people can understand local communities need to be able to give us guidelines on how they want to receive their knowledge. And this has actually two good effects. One is that it can be used to train youngsters. And two, it also helps to avoid biopiracy, but because by publishing this material, it is in the public domain and as such cannot be patented by external actors. And thus helps the communities to maintain their rights. And of course, the national government also. And doing so, uh, we tried to actually give authorship in these given back materials to the local communities, and we only acted as editors. And all those works do recognize the Nagoya Protocol, indicating that any commercial use of that knowledge needs further negotiations of benefits with the local communities who are stated as authors. And of course, we try to include scientific te terminology, so good scientific, good botanical uh, terminology for plant parts, good description of different growth forms, leaf forms, uh, reproductive parts, fruit forms, adapted iconography for uses so that local people could actually understand what a certain use meant or what a certain plant part meant. And we try to illustrate this well. First of all, giving a good, correct botanical description that would allow every user, not just the local communities, but also, for example, other scientists or interested commercial users to identify the species. And then, of course, good descriptions of the uses and good illustrations of the uses. One, to maintain that tradition, but two, also to be able to show how these plants were actually prepared so that the documentation was complete. And doing all this, we also translated all previous studies, like uh, one from New York Botanical Garden that was done in the 1980s, but had not been translated into local language. We translated everything that had been published in the whole century from English, German, and so on to local language. And we published a updated 21st century ethnobotany of that tribe with tribal members as the main authors. Now, of course, sometimes um, we get the argument that books are, of course, not not having an impact factor, they are maybe not recognized by university administrations and fund funding bodies and so on and so on. 
And this is exactly something we have to get away from. And one example is this one. Um, we published two books on Peruvian, Andean and Amazonian ethnobotany. And the Spanish version had over 150,000 downloads and is used widely all over Latin America. So this shows that a local language volume can actually have a huge impact. And of course, um, a lot of colleagues who are downloading these volumes are also citing them, which means it is a very good way to one, implement the Nagoya protocol, but also second, uh, to make sure that our scientific achievements are very widely shown. And we try to change publication practice. In this Chacopo study, we try to include all the teachers as authors in all uh, publications, and that's in, that includes a paper in Nature Plants indicating how they conduct, conducted a study and what excellent work they did. And of course, how we then analyzed that material. And in this case, we frequently ran into um, racist comments in the Anglo-speaking community because we had reviewers who asked, well, how, how can these tribal people participate in a publication? Because maybe they can't even read and write. And this is actually exactly something that is not correct under the Nagoya protocol. They have the right to participate in publications because ultimately it is their knowledge that we're documenting. And if they would not participate, we could actually do absolutely nothing. So I think the pandemic has given us a very good chance to one, show the huge importance of our science for the correct identification of remedies that might be interesting for uh, treating symptoms in pandemics like COVID-19 or even serve as remedies. And on the second part, to implement the Nagoya protocol to be able to do more ethnobotanical studies by working closer together with local participants and in doing so, not only get good documentation of traditional knowledge with all aspects, including correct identification of species, uh, recipes, application methods, and so on, that in turn might have economic applications. Uh, Dr. Mao was mentioning bioprospecting. So I think the pandemic has taught us that we can actually use it as a tool to foster our science. And I'm certainly looking forward to see much more of the Society of Ethnobotanists um, online in the future. I'm also looking forward very much to see the journal Ethnobotany as online journal, because it will have a very, very broad audience. And of course, uh, I, I always would be very happy uh, to participate in that. So I will leave some time for questions. Uh, sorry again for the screen sharing problem. I hope uh, you could at least see the slides now and uh, thank you very much. The talk on the COVID-19 pandemic and its probable effects on ethnobiological research and international collaboration addressing the contribution of traditional knowledge in the management of the pandemic and the changes in research under the Convention of Biological Diversity and the attached Nagoya Protocol and the reflection of the possibilities for future studies in a post-COVID world delivered by Dr. Busman was enriching and very relevant to the present scenario. Thank you, sir, for giving us your valuable time and enriching us on this topic. Now we would like to proceed for a short interactive session of the proposal. So uh, our questions may uh, go one by two with your questions, one by one. And uh, we we'll proceed with the session interactive session. Okay, sir. I'm Dr. Mao. Yes, Dr. Uh, right, right now I wanted to ask 
in your country, in your institute or country, how this uh, ethnobotany is studied. Either it's by PhD student or it's a uh, uh, that regular researchers are doing. Uh, it is actually both. Uh, we have we have PhD students doing studies, and uh, we have regular researchers. Uh, Georgia is a very uh, interesting case because uh, during the Soviet Union, um, education level was raised very, very highly. Uh, the Russians took people out of the villages to give them university education, and then they returned. So a lot of villagers have actually degrees and are, are very easy to work with because they understand very easily what the research is about. But uh, I mean, our institute is, is working globally so we do have masters, PhD students uh, in collaboration all over the place. Some, some of them are actually in, in J and K, and we hope to expand that. And to do a lot of publishing, you might have seen uh, the ethnobotany of mountain regions that, that we're giving out with Springer right now. Uh, which includes a volume on the Himalayas. And of course, uh, it would be very nice to do more collaborative work in other mountain regions of, of India. And, and by the way, um, feel free to share my email uh, to all participants, because if somebody wants a publication, I'm very happy to send it to them. So, Dr. Rena. Uh, thank you very much uh, for a very nice uh, talk and uh, you have uh, certainly given a, a very new field uh, and in uh, Jharkhand region also we are interacting and we are organizing the trainings for among the tribals medicine men and uh, during that uh, trainings and interaction with the tribals a lot of new things uh, they come certainly you are very right that the matter of uh, giving the IPRs or the patents, their names in the publications. So now we have also opened uh, the membership uh, also for our, so in the society for the tribal medicine men also. Particularly we have taken, uh, we have started digitization of this tribal medicine men also in the Jharkhand region. So one thing certainly other than uh, this Nagoya protocol, uh, which should know, which have not been followed one example I would like to cite, and everybody will be knowing here, that one plant is Sisas quadrangularis. It is called as the Harjur. And I think each and every tribal community in India is using for uh, for uh, mean bone-related problems, bone fractures and all. And uh, you see now recently the Himalaya company has come and uh, they have made uh, the tablets. But uh, where are the, I mean, any I mean, uh, these tribal communities have not been given any I mean, uh, I mean benefit or any I mean right to of IPR or any benefit under CBD Article 8J also. So these are the things which has to be seen because they have started earning a lot of money out of it. And there are several examples uh, like this. The company companies, uh, these private pharma companies, they have started taking up uh, I mean these plants and uh, with the I mean the leads from the tribal uh, see the I mean the knowledge and they have started making formulations preparations they have started taking patents so these things are to be uh, certainly addressed and i will also welcome you also uh, in our society if, and uh, we'll get your papers also for our journal and uh, take a membership of our society i would like to have your email and then i will take the email and i will send you the forms of the society and uh, uh, how to contribute for the journal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the comment. This it would be a great, great, great pleasure to, to contribute. I'll, I'll put my email in, in the messaging. Um, and I think India India is, is probably the country where uh, ethnobotany is most important in the world because it, it has a huge diversity, both biologically and, and ethnically, of course. Yes, you are right. And a, a lot of population. So I think ethnobotany has, has a, a huge future. Nice uh, to, to see it growing even more. Yes, yes, you are right. Thank you.
Hello. Am I audible now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. This is Vijay Wag from uh, National Botanical Research Institute, Lucknow. Sir, my question is regarding the cultural indices. Sir, while using the cultural indices, uh, you said uh, so some have to use the n number of cultural indices for uh, for the credibility of a particular plant uh, group. So, sir, is there any criteria? Or is there any thing to which cultural indices is used for which studies? Example is for I think we have we have broken up a little bit, but I, I'll 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 try to answer the question. Um, the 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 problem is that in in the last say twenty five years, almost one hundred different ecological indices have been used in some way or other for ethnobotanical studies. So. Um, informant consensus, relative frequency, use value, diversity of uses, cultural importance are the most commonly used. And uh, they, they all will give you different results. And, and of course, it's very hard to, to compare, say, a vegetation community with people. So while indices have helped to, to make ethnobotany more uh, scientific because it's more statistics uh, they have not really helped to elucidate important plants so for example um, frequency of citation is very often used uh, to, in, in ethnopharmacological studies to say this plant is most frequently cited and everybody agrees and for that reason it's a very important medicinal plant which is complete nonsense because most of the species that are frequently cited are very common, used for very simple applications. And the, the medicinal plants that might, use, might be used by specialists for important diseases normally don't come out in, in frequency of citation because very few people know them. So I'm not against the use of indices. I mean, I'm using it myself, but there is no in this no individual index that that gives you a good picture in any study so if you use indices you have to use a variety and then interpret them well because one thing we also do frequently and i include my group there is we say uh, x researcher found that this plant was very important in their study it's the same in our study and again frequently it's common species and it's, it's comparing really apples and oranges. It does not give good information. So we, I think we have to come to a point where we restructure the use of indices so that they are really useful. Otherwise, it's a simple, simple mathematical exercise that really doesn't give us anything. Um, it would be nice if we could create an index of indices. So put all these indices together in one formula, but uh, this is a very challenging mathematical problem, but I know there are very good statisticians in India, so maybe there is a colleague who can do it. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you. We'll proceed with the next question. Uh -huh. Sir, thank you uh, for your uh, uh, wonderful uh, talk. I am uh, Dr. Sashidharan from Forest Research Institute, uh, Coimbatore. Sir, how how far the benefit sharing mechanism has uh, percolated down to the local communities? What are all the constraints you feel in this uh, uh, transfer of uh, the benefits to the local communities? 
I would say a very good question. Um, thank you. I, I think it depends where you are. For example, here in Georgia, we have not even implemented the Nagoya protocol. So here th there is no mechanism whatsoever. Uh, in countries like, like Bolivia, the government has finally ratified the Nagoya protocol and has tried to establish uh, a framework to give communities more rights in the process but it, it still is extremely hard to implement. And I think the only successful examples I have seen was between honest researchers and honest private companies with the local communities. It's, it's essentially going back to where we were before uh, the Nagoya Protocol. If, if we do ethical research and ethical marketing, then the communities will benefit. But if, if there is very little ethics uh, in, in a company, then they always get away with it. And as, as, uh, as Dr. Goyle said, well, the Himalaya case is, is actually a good one because uh, the, in theory, there are all frameworks in place in India, but there is still a company that, that can get away uh, with benefiting from traditional knowledge without giving much back to the community. So I think it's, it's a very, very complicated case and we are very far from really implementing it. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. We'll proceed with the next question. If anyone has any questions, Go ahead with the question. Last question. I, I just, uh, Dr. Rene, what about funding in your country? How is the funding for ethnobotanical studies? Um, I have to say, unfortunately, it is terrible uh, for, especially at, at this point, for two reasons. One, um, well, Georgia is, is a poor country and uh, has suffered a lot in, in the pandemic. So the government is, is still spending a lot of, of money on subsidy, subsidies uh, to, to make the economic effects of the pandemic less. And our second problem is, is the crisis in Ukraine now, uh, because uh, we are getting a lot of new immigrants, especially from Russia. And uh, they are mostly IT people who come with a lot of money and drive up the local prices. Um, so economically speaking, right now we have no funding for economic for, for ethnobotany uh, because there is simply no government income and everybody has to struggle with the crisis. No, what I mean to say is earlier, before that, you were getting uh, proper support from the government or not for these ethnobotanical studies? Yes, uh, oh yeah, before, before that, absolutely the government was was supporting uh, ethnobotanical studies especially studies uh, conducted by by masters and phd students so we had a nice program uh, for stipends uh, along those lines because georgia has recognized that it has a long plant use tradition that could serve for economic development so pre-crisis we're actually we're doing pretty well and uh, unfortunately now uh, it's it's not so great but we hope uh, it, it, situation will improve at some point uh, would, but of course, Georgia is a very small country with a small population, which always makes it more diff difficult. To tell us any breakthrough, any important finding or something, success story from the ethnobotanical studies from your... Oh, group. absolutely. Any, uh, I actually give you two examples. One is related to food. Uh, our studies have shown that Georgia is probably uh, the country where most in on the world where most species are used for food. So the highest number of species used for food as compared to all other studies I know has been fo uh, found here in Georgia, which of course is a great resource uh, for future development of, of interesting crops under a climate change scenario. So this is the positive side. Uh, say that the negative side is in medicines, because when we when we started here, we thought that there would be a lot of uh, tradition on use of local medicines and so on, and we found that most medicinal plants that are used are actually common species that are mentioned in Greek herbal books like Dioscorides and so on, 
uh, that were transferred to Georgia during Soviet times, so, so Soviet herbal books. And traditional knowledge on medicine is, is basically gone uh, because it, this, this Central European knowledge has completely superimposed. So it's, it's two interesting findings. Uh, maybe third, uh, it's very important to see the historic context because uh, again, when we came here, we saw there are so many little gardens with so many species. So we thought herb gardens and, 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 and so on are traditional. And of course, they're not. They're also relict of Soviet times because everybody could only cultivate a very small plot. So anything that looked traditional in that regard is an artifact of, of history, but it's not traditional at all. So it, it turned out to be an interesting example um, for the fact that, say, everything might be different from what we expect when we go to a place. Thank you. Well, if there are no other questions, a uh, very great pleasure from my uh, part. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. And please get in, get in touch um, for literature, for publication, uh, for joint work. So looking very much forward to it. Sir, there is a one question from YouTube uh, watcher, our participant. She want to know what is the status of documentation of ethnobotanical and traditional knowledge today and in future. Dr. N. Kritika. Uh, can, can you repeat what is the status of ethnobotanical knowledge in literature? Uh, sir, what is the status, status of documentation? Uh, of it, it very much. Knowledge? Yeah. Okay. It, it very much does. does uh, in, depend of course on the country and as, as we have shown uh, where we have we have lots of uh, uses here in in uh, georgia that we in, in in quotation marks published for the first time but if we include local language literature then i would say uh, a lot of ethnobotanical knowledge has been documented so there is a lot of information about which plants are used for a specific purpose and but there are two problems to it, both of which uh, Dr. Mao has mentioned. One is the correct in, uh, identification, because many older studies simply mention local names, and it's impossible to 100% correctly relate them to scientific names. And second, there is often very little information about uh, exact application, exact harvest, which plant parts are used, exact dosage, uh, preparation of plant mixtures. So uh, in short, when it comes to which species are used, we are, when it comes to detail, uh, the literature is still terrible and much more work is needed. So I hope that that answers the question. Thank you, sir, uh, for giving us your valuable time and enriching us on this topic. Uh, as suggested by you, we will be sharing your email ID to all the participants in the feedback form. And once again, I would like to thank you, sir, for giving us your valuable time and enriching us with knowledge and botany, ethnobotany. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much again. And uh, we, we certainly all hope at some point to have done such good work as, as Dr. Chain, but it's still a long way to go. Now, I would like to inform you all that we are also preparing an introductory video on ethnobotanical explorations made by BSI scientists in different parts of our country. And it will also be released and posted on our official YouTube channel soon. So kindly subscribe to us on YouTube and social media for more details.
and to generate these certificates on this webinar, the participants are requested to kindly note down the passport B S I capital B capital S capital I one eight nine zero and I once again repeat the passport uh, capital B capital S capital I one eight nine zero B S I one eight nine zero and please fill this passport in the feedback form. The feedback form will be sent to all participants, including those registered. And uh, you will also receive uh, Dr. Bustin's email ID on the feedback form. So we will... So we are waiting for Dr. Arvind Saklani, sir. Uh, Dr. Arvind Saklani, sir, is at the Global Ayush and Innovation Summit in Gandhinagar. So he will be joining us within five minutes. Thank you for your patience. Uh, while waiting for Dr. Saklani, if anybody wants to ask any question or we can make use of the thing, if, uh, Dr. Goyle, you can just uh, take the floor. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Sikarwar, can you give, uh, yeah, can you mean uh, rather uh, give some insight the what work you are doing and now your experiences about ethnobotany. We can take uh, the advantage of your presence because you have done a lot of work on uh, mean sacred, uh, mean uh, rather Ramayana and Gita also, and a lot of ethnobotany you have done. Uh, mean, and you are also the associated with Dr. Jain. So I would like to request you to share some of your experience in the area of ethnobotany. That will be nice because now you are from research, now you are teaching ethnobotany and you have served in several uh, uh, excellent organizations like uh, Dean Dial Research Institute at uh, Chitrakoot, now you are at Satna. So maybe uh, mean, you can give some of your experiences, share your experiences with us. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, oh. Goel Saab and uh, respected participants. Uh, I have very much long relationship with Dr. S.K. Jensen. Actually, I did my PhD in botany, uh, particularly PhD in taxonomy, uh, Flora Murana district, uh, uh, in BSI sponsored project, district flora under district flora scheme. So, uh, uh, after my PhD, uh, just a, a completion of my PhD. My, I have submitted my thesis in uh, 6 March 1990 and 9 March uh, 1990 was, uh, I was called for interview in Botanical uh, uh, All India Coordinated Project on Ethnobiology. So I went there and uh, the, uh, the interview was held on the 9th at uh, NBRI. So, Dr. S.K. Jain, Dr. J.K. Mahishwari, and Dr. K.S. Saraswat, eight or nine people were, were in the board. So, they have asked a lot of questions related to taxonomy, and I have given all the satisfied answers. But last, Dr. Jain asked, what is ethnobotany? So, I just, uh, 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 Dr. Goel sir said, uh, I don't know ethnobotany, I have answered. But, they have told there is no problem. You are very good tax novice, so uh, you have to join this project. So uh, I have joined NBRI under Dr. J.K. Maheswari in All India Coordinated Project on Ethnobiology. And uh, in 1991, Dr. After the retirement of J.K. Maheswari, uh, I have joined uh, one CSIR project under uh, uh, Dr. S.K. Jain. Uh, uh, comparative ethnobotanical study between India and Latin America. So since then, uh, I have worked with Dr. Askezian till 2000, uh, uh, 10, 2000, directly under three projects. 
as RA in different CSR project. Thereafter, I have joined this uh, 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 Research Institute at Chitrakut, but I was regularly touch in uh, SK Jansar. He used to call me every uh, second or third days. We have published one book, Bharat Ke Durlo Paude, published by NBT Government of India National Book Trust. And uh, there are several articles we have written together. And uh, presently, I am uh, working uh, in uh, uh, Satna AKS University as a uh, professor in environmental science and director traditional center for traditional knowledge research and application. So at present, I am working on one PBR. I am making one People's Biodiversity Register sponsored by uh, Biodiversity, State Biodiversity Board. So oh. one uh, the, uh, PBR I am preparing at present. And uh, other work I have done on Flora of Chitrakut, I have published uh, Flora of Chitrakut. My book is coming on uh, phytodiversity of Satana district. It is very recently one or two, within two, one or two weeks it will come out. And my another book, Flora of uh, uh, Morena district, which is uh, again revived and it is also coming very soon. So my uh, other, other uh, work, we are working on the uh, trees and shrubs of Madhya Pradesh. So this book is also, our, our book is also ready and Bundelkhand, uh, uh, dando, uh, dando Cranology of Bundelkhand region. So this book is also coming. So uh, I am working on uh, taxonomy as well as ethnobotany. I have uh, completed several projects on ethnobotany, worked with Dr. Pushpang, then three, four years I have worked with Dr. Pushpang then in NBRI. So uh, uh, I am working on tradition knowledge also, but two students working under my uh, supervision uh, on uh, ethnobotany at present uh, in AKS University. So uh, this this work that I am doing. That's uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sikharwar. <laughs> and uh, just uh, when uh, I was told uh, to say something about uh, ethnobotany, the Society of Ethnobotanists, at that time I, was, uh, I also was uh, told to tell something about contributions of Dr. S. K. Jain. You see. Um, uh, at that time, I forgot. So taking the advantage of uh, this time, those uh, maybe there may be so many persons, those who have never seen Dr. Jain. So maybe they may be uh, eager to learn about, uh, know about Dr. Jain and his contributions. You see, Dr. S.K. Jain, a renowned botanist with global recognition and popularly known as the father of Indian ethnobotany. And uh, you see, last year, the same date, he expired and he was suffering from COVID-19. Dr. Jain was born on June 30th, 1926 in Amroha, Uttar Pradesh, India. He belonged to a very simple farmer's family in Shivara Township in Uttar Pradesh. In 1946, he received his master's degree at the University of Allahabad in Allahabad. At the university, Dr. Jain worked with Professor M. B. Razada in FRI for postgraduate training in the plant taxonomy. And then from 1946 to 47, he worked at the Division of Myco Mycology and Plant Pathology of the Indian Agricultural Research Institute, Delhi, for postgraduate dissertation work. In 1947, the year India gained independence, Dr. Jain started his scientific career as assistant professor at Meerut College, Meerut, Uttar Pradesh, and was there until 1949. You see, when Dr. Jain was working in 1946 with Dr. M. B. Razada for uh, training in plant taxonomy, at that time also he came in contact with Professor N. L. Vore, a great taxonomist on grasses. You see, uh, this pulse I can understand because I was a, a student at that time. Now Dr. Saklani has also come. So in very short, I will read this and then we can listen to Dr. Saklani. Dr. Jain 
served on the editorial staff of the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, Publication and Information Directorate, now CSIR, uh, Niskea, from 1951 to 53, and then National Botanical Research Institute, 1953 to 56. Later, he joined the Botanical Survey of India at Pune Regional Circle, uh, and he served there 1956 to 60. And then, uh, uh, he worked in Kolkata in 1960 to 71, and uh, this position uh, he worked at Calcutta as well as uh, Pune and Allahabad. He joined as a SB systematic botanist to work on ethnobotany. As earlier mentioned, also in 1965, Dr. Jain earned his doctorate from Pune University under the guidance of S. Santa Pau, a renowned taxonomist, and then. Dr. Jain served the BSI Shillong and Kolkata centers from 71 to 7, 1977 as deputy director. Dr. Jain became the joint director at BSI Kolkata center and then he became the director in 1978. After, and he retired and superannuated in June 1984. After the retirement, Dr. Jain joined NBRI in Lucknow after being awarded a Pitambar Pant National Environmental Fellowship from the Ministry of Environment and Forest. Dr. Jain specialized in ethnobotany, medicinal plants, plant taxonomy, particularly floristics, grasses and orchids, uh, and conservation of endangered taxa. Dr. Jain described more than 25 taxa new to science, and one genus and more than 20 species were named after him in his commemoration. He intensively explored all over the India, including Andaman and Nicobar Islands, and consulted on most of the major Indian herbaria, as well as some in Australia, China, France, Indonesia, Russia, Singapore, Thailand, United Kingdom, and United States. Dr. Jain pioneered the Flora of India scheme in 1977 at BSI as a major project devoted to the inventorization, the plant life of India. He launched a research project on endangered and endemic species, the POSEP project, as well as All India Coordinated Research Project on Ethnobiology, as Dr. Sikarwar was mentioning. I also worked in that project. In 1986, Dr. Jain was uh, named Emeritus Scientist by CSIR for his project, Comparative and Directive Studies on Ethnobotany. The outcome of this project was his famous book, Directory of Indian Folk Medicine and Ethnobotany. During as you know, the turmeric case was born based on this publication. Dr. Jain was the founding president of the Society of Ethnobotanists in 1980. In 1989, a program to enrich the field of ethnobotany he started the journal Ethnobotany. On August 1995, Dr. Jain laid the foundation of the Institute of Ethnobiology in Lucknow. He became the first honorary director of IOE. In 2002, IOE was shifted to Jivaji University Gwalior. Madhya Pradesh, and now this is it is known as the SK Jain Institute of Ethnobiology uh, to commemorate his significant contributions. Dr. Jain helped establish ethnobotany in India and mentored and guided several students, over a dozen students in the area of ethnobotany, plant taxonomy, and conservation. His sustained efforts helped various universities include uh, ethnobotany in curricula and graduate, postgraduate, MPhil and DPhil programs. Dr. Jain received numerous prestigious national and international awards and fellowships, including the Fellow of Indian National Science Academy, 1982, and then Linear Society of London, and the Panchanan Maheshwari Medal from Indian Botanical Society, J.W. Harshberger Medal from Society of Ethnobotanists, Professor Shyam Bahadur Saxena Memorial Award from INSA, Dr. S. Santa Pau Medal from APT Association for Plant Taxonomy, William Carey Medal, and Lifetime Achievement Award from Institute of Ethnobiology, Indian Botanical Society, as well as the Botanical Survey of India in the year 2020. He was the first Asian to receive the Distinguished Economic Botanist Award from the Society of Economic Botany in 1990, 1999. He published more than 300 research papers and a popular articles, including 176 publications in the field of ethnobotany in the national and international journals and magazines. 
authored and edited more than 52 books and guided more than 14 doctoral students at various universities dr jain was invited to lecture at several organizations and universities including harvard university partly because of his efforts mainly many funding agencies now regard ethnobotany as a notable area of research dr jain continued to promote ethnobotany until his death his later ideas about studies on urban ethnobotany were timely and will be carried forward by his disciples dr jain was a great source of inspiration and he had a sharp memory he remembered most things and was a living encyclopedia so we are eagerly waiting now one of his most precious student dr saklani dr saklani i think he has come so dr saklani is there yes i am can listen to him now yeah. can you can you hear me yes 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 we can hear you Hello. yeah very good because it's too noisy here i mean this is uh, summit yeah good afternoon everybody can you help me out how to share my screen there please uh, get the present now option in on your screen there is and and uh, then present now and then i i say entire screen yes sir both option from the left side just a second entire screen No, no, no. No, I go to more options. I go to present now, right? Yes. 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 Yeah, it has come now. It has come now. Oh, wonderful! Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, all of you. Dr. Mao, I am thankful to you, Dr. Goel sir, Dr. Sikla Raji, and all of my friends there. Uh, it's too noisy, and I'm sorry for the disturbance because I had come here for the Global IU Summit. We just finished that program. Uh, now, uh, today, what the topic that I had actually proposed. is the relevance of retina botany in india retrospect and prospects i'm thankful to bsi for inviting me for this uh, great opportunity and today is the day when uh, we celebrated here global eye summit in ahmedabad gandhinagar and lot of emphasis was given on traditional medicine on ethno medicines tribal medicines and i think it's just coincidence that we are sharing this day with uh dr sk jains first death anniversary so we pay a tribute on this uh, first death anniversary dr sudanshu kumar jain ji he was a great teacher for all of us we all know that 
and I remember the days when he would sit in NBRI in this particular room, which I have shown here, always surrounded with the books, journals, and his papers. So we remember that you know point of time. Dr. S. K. Jain is the person we remember him who initiated, nurtured, and established the subject ethnobotany in India past almost six decades, starting from 1960s onwards, even early late 50s as well. And let me capture a few information for you. I remember he had shown me this letter once, which he got from DJ e. Fox, who had written a book, An Introduction to Ethnobotany in 1958. And he wrote there that yours was the first letter I have had from India on the subject of ethnobotany. I was very pleased to receive it because I think that India may have a great pleasure, great deal to teach the world in the applications of some of the things I have talked about in the last sections of that agrarian village and so on. So this is the quality that Dr. Jain had he started his career in ethnobotany, I'm saying, talking to people across the world. He connected first with the people who are the who are contemporary, who actually was working on the field of ethnobotany in different parts of the world. She's the lady who actually uh, asked Dr. S. K. Jain to start this subject. Admiral Dr. E. K. Janaki Amal initiated ethnobotanical section at the CBL DSI Allahabad. She did, did express loud thinking and a wish in her publications, which was admirably fulfilled later by Dr. Sudhanshu Kumar Jain. On the right hand side, you see he is sitting, he is with uh, our uh, father of modern ethnobotany, Dr. R. V. I. Schultz. We all know Dr. Schultz very well, who spent a lot many years in Amazon forest and he wrote uh, books like Divine Mushrooms and on Psychiatric Plants and so on. Dr. Jain was well connected to many policy makers, including the then prime ministers and uh, presidents and all. He is the person who actually initiated uh, Henning Korsunet Nabati and he allowed people to really capture some information on it about me, gathered people. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, thought, I thought this is disconnected. Anyways, this was the first training course you organized in NBRI. And this is the photograph of Moti Mahal Hostel, wherein, like, you know, you see all senior scientists now, including sitting in the center Dr. Sani, Dr. S. L. Kapoor, Dr. Jain, Madam, uh, then Dr. H. Shah. Ved Prakash Tripathiji is uh, no more with us. Dr. Hazra is on the extreme left there. And there are so many dignitaries which are now retired or some of them may be retiring pretty soon. Another training course was connected in 1988. And then he created a workforce basically for ethnobotanists in the whole country. And many people from different universities, colleges, institutions, he brought them together and asked to read a lot, to read and then learn about it, about me, how it can be taken further. This was the first event uh, in India in 1994, International Congress on, of Ethnobiology. Uh, in the center, you see uh, Dr. Jan there, then Dr. Anthony Cunningham. I'm in touch with Dr. Tony. And then we have Daryl Posey, Dr. Sane, and there are so many dignitaries in this. This was one of the first and most successful international congress of ethnobiology in the country. And I remember that time the plague was there in Gujarat. Still, we had 82 foreign delegates from different parts of the world. Many people, they had to cancel their programs because of this problem there. But still, we had a very good participation. And I remember how Dr. Daryl Posey on the left side here, Anthony Cunningham, how they appreciated Dr. Swami, uh, Dr. Ms. Swami Nathan and Dr. Sane, they were there in the inaugural function. Now, this was the organizing committee, and if you remember these guys who are actually the you know people who promoted ethnobotany, 
Uh, next to me is Dr. K.K. Singh. He is no more, unfortunately. Dr. Mahashuri, we lost him. Dr. Virendranath is there. Malia. Then Dr. Mehrotra, uh, one of the stalwarts in CDRI. Dr. K.K. Goel, uh, looking very young there. Dr. Jain, then Anthony Cunningham. Sharma, and behind them is also Mr. Sharma. Then Dr. Brizlal, Ved Prakash Tripathi Ji, then Usha Soh Madam, our Roma Mitra Madam, then A.K.S. Rawat, and Dr. Hazra. Dr. Hazra is, I mean, sorry, Dr. Dr. Rao, who is so active. Now we'll be listening him today evening for our another program. You know, we are uh, organizing in the evening for two hours program, commemorative event on the first death anniversary of Dr. Jain. Dr. Jain is remembered for his hard work and hard field work. You know, you see a lot of students here. Dr. Sikarwar, uh, Dr. Bhotakur there, Dr. Goel and me. This was the program, the Smart Watch program. He conducted many detailed programs in different parts of the country. Dr. Jain was always uh, in, always in search mode. So this was another area he was working on. He emphasized a lot of information, ethnobotanical information is actually hidden in this herb area. So he must study. Again, we remember for his lot many awards and accolades in uh, my different societies. The first uh, person to get distinguished economic botanist award, as Dr. Goel mentioned just now, so many awards uh, to his credit. Uh, he got a uh, lifetime achievement award from IBS. He's a person who started the journal Ethnobotany in 1989, if I am correct. So at that time, you know, we had a good group like Dr. N.C. Shah, Dr. Sil Kapoor, uh, Dr. Jain, Dr. Faruqi was also there. And those, you know, Dr. Goel, Dr. Vidpradash, Dr. Partiji, so many people, they, you know, actually worked so hard to initiate the journal. Now, these are some of the, some of the milestones. Uh, in 1980, we, we established uh, Society of Ethnobotanists. Now we have more than 500 members there. 1989, General Ethnobotanist established. 1994, first IC. Then 1995, we initiated SK Jain Institute of Ethnobiology. Dr. A.K. Jain actually took care of all this institute in Gwalior. We have published so many books. Dr. Jain, Dr. Goel has already mentioned about this. There are a few books you can see on the screen. More than 45 books he has written. Now, another important uh, milestone that he has is the Dictionary of Indian Folk Medicine and Ethnobotany that was published in 1991. And Vatika took it further and uh, she compiled the Dr. Jain Company of Indian Folk Medicine and Ethnobotany in 2016. So what was important here? There were quite a few species which were common, like 1,800 species. There were quite a few species which were uh, like new uh, edition for the ethnobotany of India, like 2,800. And 700 species were actually missing in the new one. And those who are interested in biography of Dr. Jain, they can go to this uh, Google and they can find this paper there. I'll be sharing this presentation with uh, Dr. Rao, BSI. Uh, this is how actually Indian ethnobotany started in the country. Uh, BSI was the first concern, took it up, and then this ethnobotany started in CSIR, in different laboratories like National Botanical Research Institute, IHBT, and many regional research laboratories like Jorhat, Bhubaneswar. I'm in Jammu. These were the key centers for ethnobotany. And if you remember the All India Coordinated Research Project on Ethnobiology, it was started actually in Jammu. But NBRI Lucknow was the key center for that. Dr. J.K. Maheshwari was taking care of the center. And I remember Dr. Brizlal, uh, Dr. Harish Singh in BSI now, and Dr. Sikarwar, Dr. Pangoli, and so many people, they were associated with this project here in NBRI. And this was also part of BSI programs in different cycles. Dr. Henry, if I remember correctly, he was there in Kaimatu. He was taking care of that, and in different centers, it was done. Then, the similar programs on ethnobotany started, or rather, ethnomedicines in CCRIMH, in CCRAS, 
and ICMR. ICAR started actually working on the crops, agricultural crops, which are cultivated for the wild races. I remember Dr. R. K. Arora. He was interested always in the wild relatives and variety species of uh, you know the crops which are grown by the tribals. The TBGRI was another center where it started. Mirbal Sani Institute of uh, Ethnobotany, I remember that time, sorry, Mirbal Sani Institute of Ethnobotany, where Dr. Vishnu Mitre was there at that time. Swaminathan Foundation Research Institute. Then FRLST is another uh, key like, you know, organization where the compilation of all traditional knowledge started. And now we have a very good depth of knowledge here. Now, Ethnomedicine or ethnobotany is taught in many universities. It's a PhD program for many colleges as well. There are many NGOs and tribal research institutes. They are focused on ethnobotany. We are happy to understand now that this discipline has been incorporated at a graduate and postgraduate and even PhD level. So, ethnobotany is a thrust area of research for major funding agencies like. ICMR, CSIR, Ministry of Environment and Forest, and the ICAR, and then DST, DRDO. DRDO has done a very good work, especially in the alpine zones or the temperate zones. We have very good laboratories, for example, in Lake. So they were actually trying to get some uh, good uh, food plants for the soldiers and all that. That's how they developed some formulations also out of it. CCRS and Ayush. Ayush has taken a big initiative now. If you have heard about it, now yesterday they inaugurated Global uh, Center for Traditional Medicine. And today, if you have watched that program by Prime Minister, how he addressed and how he actually emphasized on ethnomedicine and traditional medicine in today's lecture. Even uh, just for your information, he just, uh, there was one director general of WHO, Ted Rose. He was present in the meeting and he named him as Tulsi Bhai, you know, because we are in Gujarat. He named Ted Rose Tulsi Bhai and he announced from the dais. So, this is like, you know, the what do you call this uh, importance of our ethnomedicines or ethnobotany. Now, when we are talking ethnobotany, I think we all know about this. Uh, now, it has entered into different. Uh, sections or different disciplines as well we have with you know, agriculture we have archaeobotany ecology and so on so now in in ethnobotany so ethnobotany scientific documentation of plants used by villages in food medicine food material culture and then with different actually aspects it covers that now from ethnobotanical research we have found so many unique knowledge, unique knowledges, less known information, and unexploited uses of bioresources that were not documented earlier, but now they are documented very well. Now, the important thing is what we are discussing now, ethnobotany has to evolve horizontally as well as vertically. This is very important. So, ethnobotany is an applied science like medical sciences. Therefore, it must be dynamic and evolve horizontally and vertically. So how to go for dynamic? It implies like principles of pure sciences. It has this interdisciplinary component and forced to, it is forced to change. That's why we call it dynamic. Now, vertically in the sense of concept, the definitions, the approaches, objectivity, its dimensions basically, and the credibility, contemporary relevance, and applications. These are our, like vertical growth. And when we talk about the horizontal growth, it's basically extended geographic regions and ethnic communities. We go like, you know, we spread in all things. Now, not many workers and scientists, they contributed in past six you know, decades. If you see, there are more than 100 books in public domain on ethnobotany or different aspects of ethnobotany. There are now 75 journals that are published, that are publishing information on ethnobotanical aspects. So we see a lot many opportunities in the country. You see, that's why we say, you know, we are sitting on the gold mine. We have to capitalize on that. So there are three important things here. One is our knowledge, 
another is the tribal people who are the custodians of this knowledge and third most important thing is the biological resource which we have these are the three components we have to take care of these three so if you go by this slide we have more than 8500 species that can be utilized for health benefits and most important thing is we are very rich in endemic so when it is when we say this endemic species that means we have all the privileges and advantages to work on this species find out their potential work with the local people the indigenous people and see what we can really work how we can work with this species how we can get benefit out of this knowledge and help the societies the custodians of those biological resources now another thing is if you see down there there's a huge potential but you know it takes time it takes time to evaluate the species for example cdri between 1968 to 1996 they could analyze only 3789 plant samples from 3488 species and that if you see that is for limited number of indications not for all indications what we are doing today for example today if you see even cancer there are more than 200 types of cancers so if you have to really screen all the species it will take decades so what's more important today is if we are able to create some libraries of plant extracts taken out from this medicinal plants for example so that could be helpful in the future we are rich in all kinds of tribal conditions tribal you know, traditions folk dances and you know cultures so we are still sitting with you know wealth of knowledge uh, this knowledge is always documented for example if you see in Tamrapatra or this uh, palm leaves and in monasteries and many temples still we have this kind of information sitting there uh, these i'm not really going to go in detail because you all people are familiar with the diversity that we have in indian conditions and different phytogeographical conditions the diversity that we see within the species the diversity that we see within the particular species like intraspecific diversity or genetic diversity now there are there are different there are different uh, you know species they are rich in alkaloids for example and there are many like flavonoids we can work on so many other species that we are rich and we can find this richness we all know about this uh, there are many traditional medicine that have helped to create like you know modern medicines uh, you name from uh christine wind blasting or maybe even uh, for this uh, jinko bioma and you know, we have piper metastigum then we have orophyllum like we are talking about this uh, uh, toxins uh, in the medicines it has answers practically in all different areas you take care of say it will take care of your gastrointestinal disorders respiratory disorders and so on use name any disease the tribal people or the indigenous people they have found answers for all these you know disorders or diseases this is one example that we always cite when we are talking about ethnobotany and benefit sharing uh, this is basically tricholipus zelenicus uh, somehow uh, I'm personally, if you ask me, I'm not really very comfortable with the situation that Jeevani is not seen in the market. When we are working with the tribal people or indigenous people, and when we are talking about the benefit sharing, it has to go a long way. So we should be really taking this kind of product in a very efficient manner. We should talk to the people who are actually like entrepreneurs who can take it forward and take it to the global level. Like Hudia, we know one of the species that was actually heard in different uh, sections of the world, but Jeevani did not make that kind of impact. So we have, when we are working, we have to work aggressively, and we have to collaborate with so many in a good partner, partners always. Now many industries they tried drug discovery programs, but unfortunately they failed or they shut down their doors because of the various regions. Working with natural corruption is not so easy. It's a very tough target. It's a very tough job. I was earlier with Peramal Enterprises and then we had 
a big R&D center where we are working on natural products, but then later on it was shut. So this is unfortunate. There are so many big players, they came into the picture, but they had to shut the doors. This is also very important to understand how to motivate, how to motivate industry and people, the common people, to really you know take these disciplines forward. We are facing problems in natural products as well. Now this is another issue that you now we are facing and we will be facing because of the development. On the left hand side, I saw uh, uh, showing you Dr. S. K. J. Hans and Dr. Abhut Sundaral Bhavanaj picture. They, are, they were both contemporary and they were very good friends. And if you see, unfortunately, they died in the difference of just one month last year. We lost both of them. And both were working on the similar cause almost. Sundaral Bhavanaj, he worked for Terry Dam project. Like he was environment, environmentalist, Dr. S. K. Jain, he worked for traditional knowledge, and both were almost similar things. So if you see the picture out there, it's a Terry Dam, or sorry, the Terry Town earlier, and how everything has is now sunk in the water, and this whole tradition, all the society of the what do you call this, everything is gone down the water. There is nothing left. This is another view I am showing you. This is uh, one small town where I studied. This is Uttarkashi in uh, Himalaya, Uttarkashi in Uttarakhand area. You see, earlier in 1994 or before that, you know, it was all like very few said. Down there, it was all again changed in 2017. And now, on the right hand side, if you see, it's full of concrete jungles. So then, while we are talking about traditional knowledge, while, while we are talking about this uh, uh, ethnomedicine, ethnobody, and so many things, at the same time, we have to remember that how these jungles are turning into cities and concrete jungles. This is another thing, how we are actually, the population is growing, and the, how forests are, cover is going down. So you see the Amazon forest, how this what we call lungs, our lungs, they are burning, they are burning the lungs. The whole carbon sink is actually going down. This is our uh, Indira point in uh, Anwan Nico, uh, Nicobar Islands. If you see before and if you see after the tsunami, how we lost the whole vegetation, completely washed off. So the point here is, unless we evaluate, unless we really, you know, evaluate, learn about these species, what was existing there, we really, otherwise we'll be losing like this. In the pandemic time, you must have heard how these traditional medicines, how they help the Ayush sector as well. Now it is talked about, you know, everywhere we are talking about the Ayush medicines and Ayush sector. It has lot many potentials. One of my friends, he is in uh, Jayantia Hills in uh, uh, Joai is Dr. Pekinton. Uh, Dr. Mao knows him very well. And he has his own like traditional medicine garden. He treats cancers. He has treated more than 100 patients of cancer and very difficult, different, uh, difficult kind of cancers he has treated with the indigenous medicine. Now, when I met him uh, about say four years ago, I told him that why don't you teach to others? Because tomorrow you never know. This whole secret will go with you. So then now he has started teaching uh, the same thing to his daughter, fortunately. This is another area that, you know, when we are talking about ethnobotany and the potential, so we talk about the cross-cultural ethnobotanical studies. Means we have to really, you know, compare the knowledge. We have to establish the credibility of the knowledge. And we have to understand the strength and limitations of this knowledge. Now the important thing is when we document, we analyze the gaps, where are the problems, and how to disseminate the useful traditional knowledge. For example, if one community is using, say, root part of a particular species, is there any other community that are using the aerial parts of this particular community? Hello. The background. Pardon? I can't hear you. Can you repeat that? Sir, there is too much noise on your background. We cannot I know, I know. Actually, it's very tough to. No, is it not audible completely or how? Sir. 
Okay, so then you want me to shift somewhere? It will take just two minutes. Just, just wait. I'll try. Hello. Can you hear a little bit? Uh, yes, sir. Just a minute, then I have to go to a place where it is a little shady. I think you have come out. I have come out, and this is very tough for me, also. You know. Yes, yes, yes. I mean. Yeah, uh, I can. I can see my screen as well. Anyway, I'll try to just now read it out. It's a very tough. Yeah. Okay, I'll just maybe try to make it. Uh, now, if you when they are talking about this cross cultural study. So this is on the northeast India, and uh, what we say is the. Uh, I think it's not readable here. I'll just go to a little shady place, please. Hey, allow me, allow me. Hello. Hello. Hey, can you hear now? Okay, okay, okay. I can see my screen at least. Now it's very tough actually. There are thousands of people here, and it's very tough to find a place. Anyway, so what I was telling is uh, when we are talking about this, you can see my screen. I would like okay. to request you to conclude within 10 minutes. Pardon? I would like to request you to conclude within 10 minutes, sir. Cell phone. Then I have to really open it. Sir, I would like to request you to conclude within 10 minutes. You can see that right now. Right? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, okay. Then I'll go ahead now. I can see the screen now. Okay. Uh, so we were talking about this uh, cross-cultural ethnobotany, okay, say so ethnobotanical studies. So here we see like a ABC of ethnobotany, ethnic communities. We are talking, this is a basis of livelihood we have to study there. We have, when we are talking about cross-cultural study, we have to study the day-to-day -day life, connectivity with the other communities, accessibility of uh, modern facilities, dependency on bioresources, uh, knowledge base, in different age groups now the problem here is what we are observing the oldest people they are they are either gone or they have moved out so we are actually facing this problem in many many areas and they are not teaching actually their next generations so though we talk about uh, now traditional knowledge and traditional uh, indigenous knowledge but we are not finding people the right people in different age groups now you know, when we are talking about the documentation and taking it further. Now, how to understand this basically and this inherited uh, knowledge, the acceptability of old tradition. This is another important aspect, whether the people are following or is it just for the documentation for our purpose? Because many youngsters, they just go to like, you know, allopathy or some other medicines. 
so they really do not follow this then willingness willingness to pass on this uh, or share the traditional knowledge that i just mentioned and the learning habit in the younger generations now when we are talking about the bio resources we have these uses whether the bio resources are available there whether these are the endemic species this is very important to document then the collection preservation and processing methods this is again very important for us many times you know if you see in inventories of ethno medicine or ethno botany rather is just like you know plant is uh, it take leaves leaves are taken crushed and made into paste and then applied so this is it but if you really want to use this knowledge for further like you know maybe uh, verification or uh, modifications you cannot use this information not at all so you have to really document in a very elaborate manner then uses pattern whether it is restricted to a particular society or it is common to others then which are the parts used and why they are using particular part and uniqueness in that knowledge and so on so this is on north east india when i was working there so we tried to gather all this information this is on ethno medicinal plants 940 species i'm not going detail now uh, we have lot many opportunities when we are talking about there are some species where we are facing issues even in ayush also we are facing issues uh, we are using in many times we are using substitutes we are using adulterants why because these species are not available so this is basically related to the medicine or ayush medicine even ethno medicine because all this knowledge what we see in ayush today it has ultimately evolved through traditional medicine very bark species many species which are mentioned in dashmula list or dashmula or maybe other you know bark other species like picoriza is another species where we are facing problems there are some species where you have huge potential but we are not really capitalizing on that traditionally i remember when uh, i was in uttarakhand we were using this perilla fluorescence quite a bit and now i understand when i am in the nutraceutical industry i understand this is is very rich in omega 3 omega 6 and omega 9 fatty acids this on the right hand side you have this another species called parkia and uh, this parkia basically is very very rich in protein especially for vegetarians this is very rich this grows widely you know quite abundantly in manipur now earlier they were importing it from myanmar now when we are talking about the documentation in our studies how to really what to capture and what not to capture the very important thing is for example when we are trying uh, for say drug discovery programs or ethno medicine all these parameters we have to actually document for example what is the concept of disease you know when we are talking to the to the tribal medicinal healer or somebody there what are the symptoms that he is actually looking after how would they describe a disease what are the method of diagnosis and how they relate to the modern concept then there are different aspects for example ethno pharmacology the method of preparations how to remove the toxic you know elements there then uh, ingredients mode of administration the palatability basically how they make it palatable for example they are using honey or some other carriers in that how they make it bioavailable because whatever is actually made whatever is is given to the patient it has to be bioavailable it has to be available to the organs whether they are using honey milk cow urine and so on so there are like you know uh, basis for that then what are the doses we have to jot down in very detail the duration of uh, treatment we are talking the indications and contraindications the efficacy safety adverse effect this is also important many times we forget that to ask even the you know personal healer there then interaction with other herbs he would tell you unless you ask him he won't tell you whether it is whether you should take something with this or not to take with something so you have to actually study this interaction of the herbs also then what are the doses form so this is it now pharmaceutics then data on the healers you have to really gather all this data and doses form as i said so how it is used basically in different forms and this is another thing that you know, i had created earlier plant extract library and similarly we can actually create ethno medicinal plant extract library or ethno botanical plant extract library because we have more emphasis now on 
nutraceuticals or the ethnic food. The food and medicine, they are actually synonymous. So they go hand in hand. So we have to document those things. And if we can create that kind of libraries, they can be screened for various uh, you know, parameters and then we can go for credibility of those claims. For example, what we did is, whatever is mentioned in, say, ethnobotany, we try to establish some credibility, whether they have some potential or not. So when we, when we check for anti-cancer activity, so we saw a very good like correlation in these you know, uh, studies and parameters. See, for example, inflammation. Inflammation is a broad category. And then we see now we see patients of like cancer patients or many anti-inflammatory disorders where it is actually hurting people. But we have answers in the medicines there. So now the important thing is when we are trying to create some entrepreneurs and what we have been talking about, there are many areas where we have to work. We have to work in uh, the area of conservation. We have to really study sacred groups and show our visitation in detail. That's another area. Now the uh, tribes and non uh, uh, the non-timber forest produce. Now we have many state government departments there working on non-timber forest produce, right? Then local timbers, what exactly they are using for their furnitures and other aspects. So they are very detailed study and each and every aspect actually can create industry and are creating industry. So those who are studying ethnobotanical aspects, they can actually just start working on that, start thinking on that line. So when you take up a project, when you take up a thing, you have to take it very seriously and think about the project and further developing some products out of it. Then we're talking the folk songs, folk dances, and local architecture is very important. Now it says there's a huge potential in the cities, in the you know different markets, designs and their arts is a big discipline again. Ethnomet veterinary sciences, then uh, how they are taking care of environment. This is another area layers of conservation of water, then IPR issues and regulatory aspects. Basically here, what we are talking about, if you find something interesting there, which can, where we can add some value to those resources and where these tribal people or indigenous communities can be helped. So we just you know help them to protect their intellectual property. This is very, very important. It's a responsibility basically of the ethnobotanists when we are going in the field, we help them out. We talk to the uh, you know people who are expert in these areas. There are another like you know areas where we have to brainstorm like folk taxonomy. Their food habits, their all foods, their drinks, their crafts, fiber and dyes. There are big industries based on these fibers and dyes. You understand that. So when if you are able to give one or two additional like you know crops for this, this would be a big you know uh, contribution for ethnobotanists as well. Then local market survey is another important area because we see many interesting information in the local markets, which we never, you know, see in the uh, in the literature as well. So local plants in the trade and small scale industries, basically, we get information like now the traditional cultivations and crop management. So basically, you know, how they are cultivating their you know, crops, how they are managing the crop how they're managing their crop cycle. This is very, very important. And this is good for agriculture like, scientists as well. Now, some products, for example, I'm just capturing here one example. This is uh, Herocarpus marsupium. Traditionally, if you go Madhya Pradesh, people are making cups of this hardwood of Herocarpus marsupium. This is a traditional method, okay? Now, still, if you have diabetes, somebody has diabetes, they just put some water in the cup and soak it overnight and take it in the morning, early morning. So they say it is taking care of diabetes. And it's true. We have scientific evidence for that. Now, we have a product called Terosol. So we isolated terosol beans uh, from the hardwood and we developed a product, Terosol. It's an ingredient and we are using it for various purposes, for basically taking care of diabetes. And even for, uh, we have another compound in this, which is used in the cosmetics. Now, when we, when we realize that now, if we go for hardwood, we have to really, you know, 
take the wood from uh, from forest department through auctions but after some time or maybe at a later date there could be some issues so we started our uh, uh, conservation programs in the, you know in Madhya Pradesh and so far we have planted I personally went there met the PCC after Mr. Ravi Srivastava and he was kind enough to really cooperate in that so now so far we have planted more than 50,000 trees of this Theracarpus marsupium now, very importantly, we have to understand where we are heading to. So, this is a time when we are talking about the Ayush. And today, uh, you know, Prime Minister, Honorable Prime Minister, he announced quite a few interesting things. He said, now we will be giving Ayush visa. You know, visa is generally given for anybody who is coming to the country. But now there will be Ayush visa for the people who will be coming to India for the treatment. And it could be through local, you know, traditional medicines. So Ayush visa will be given. Now this is another area what he emphasized on Ayush Aha. So earlier FSSI was giving license only for some 400 products for developing nutraceuticals. But now through Ayush Aha, when we are including those uh, Aha mentioned in Ayush into FSSI, obviously we will be having more revenues and you know markets for that in the international arena. So you see here the potential of nutraceutical industry. It's a big industry across the world, and we can use you know knowledge from traditional food and develop some nutraceutical product. This is a little easier way rather than going for drug discovery programs and going for this you know big big programs. Unfortunately, if you see so far, we do not have any plant-based drugs of India of our own. I'm talking about. So these are the areas where we can work on. So when we talk about these three things, food security, health security, and herbal security, what I mean from this herbal security is the importance of bioresource we must emphasize on. We must emphasize on conservation of medicinal plants. And we have to make it sure whoever is working or the industry is working on the herbal medicine, they have to spend their CSR money, the corporate social responsibility money for the conservation of you know, plant resources. And secure the herbs basically so with our future generation they should not be deprived of this herbs this is important for us i'm not going in detail here now what our honorable prime minister says my motive for the young scientist bargaining in this country has been innovate patent produce and prosper and it implies for everything when we are talking about the indigenous communities please remember Whoever is working on any aspect of ethnobotany, we have to think and we have to go by these four words. Always think about innovation, think about patenting that knowledge with the tribal person, whoever you are working with. Try to produce that, try to reproduce that, and come with some product for that particular community which you have studied. So that's what I have been telling everywhere. We have to give at least one or two, you know, some targets to the PhD students. Come out with one or two products when you are doing your PhD, okay, and then prosper. So what's important is a sense of responsibility that I have been telling. Enrich your R&D base, and then we have to create visionary PhD students on ethnobotany. They have to write from the day one, the guide must tell the student what you have to do and what is your target. Unless you come out with one or two good products, it could be in any area, I'm not talking only medicine, I'm talking about the food, the fiber, the dyes, you know, any kind of in textiles, so many things are there, artisans or maybe the craft or some other craft, furnitures, so they can really work on that, but work with all, put your 100% there and come out with one product at least for the community. Now, the contribution must have the wide resource and ethnic community, this is the key thing that we have to understand. That's what I told, take one or two unique products, work with villages and create entrepreneurs there in the community itself. It is our responsibility when we are going for ethnobotanical, like, you know, documentation or maybe some field work. It is our responsibility not just to document that knowledge. We have to create entrepreneurs in the society itself. You create some people there, some volunteers, and they should really, you know, work on this when you are away from the society collaborate with manufacturers, industries to take it forward, 
then handhold and give back to the communities that you study. Work on cross-cultural aspects is important again. Make aware the community of their unique bioresources. This is also a responsibility. We should not just go away by saying, by just documentation. We should tell them, this is your unique bioresource. You, should, you must work on this. You know, just last week, we signed an MOU with uh, one organization for Kokum Plantation in Konkan region, Garcini and I'm talking about. Because this is a traditional, you know, crop there, and this is endemic to Konkan Maharashtra. People were using it for empty waste kind of thing. It's a unique syrup they are using. So we have, we are going for large scale plantations of Garcinia indica in those areas. So whatever capacity you have, so you have to work in that capacity. Just prioritize their unique traditional knowledge, technology, and go for value addition. Help generating IP, intellectual property for the ethnic community. Promote cultivation of useful bioresources to commercialize. This is very, very important. Unless they, unless you promote them, unless you motivate them for cultivation of the such resources, they won't be available for future generations. They shift. You know, if you remember, for example, some developmental activities, they shift to another location. And there they find it very tough to uh, find out their own resources. So how to reduce pressure on you know, those resources, how to uh, maybe, you cannot cut short on the developmental activities, but at the same convince, or even you can really look for some alternative plantations or alternative cultivations kind of program. Now this is, I think, final slide. Uh, let's create, what I'm saying is, ethnobotanical plant extract library for evaluation for the future generation. The botanical digital library this is very very important whatever we are seeing today is like documented in the form of books but it's not accessible even to those tribal people which you have studied i don't think people really go back to the society and give their book to the society this is what i have written for you and there are no takers because they don't understand your language so we have to create platforms for those communities wherein they can really understand their own wealth of knowledge and wherein they can really take it forward for their future generations. Now we are in touch with the policy makers to create celebi on ethnobotany. Even today morning I had a good meeting with uh, Dr. Bhushan Patwardhan. He was vice chairman and uh, he was helping like you know, creating this kind of thing. So maybe we'll meet some more people and we will try to induct again taxonomy and ethnobotany in the celebi in a proper manner because we are facing a lot of problems in universities and colleges. Now we can create ethnobotanical forests in the community itself. We capture the information on their knowledge and then create volunteers, entrepreneurs, and then ask for this kind of thing. And finally, what I actually would, this is a dream of everybody, I think, National Institute of Ethnobotany. We are talking about ethnobiology, but I'm saying ethnobotany because it's a huge potential. Parallelly, we can think of something else. With this, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Saglani. It was a really nice presentation. But I had thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, sir, for the lecture delivered by Dr. Saglani on the relevant topic of India. It's very appropriate and the prospect was very interesting for us. Thank you, sir, for taking uh, time on this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hope I you could you could at least listen to me. So thank you for taking up your time of the of the summit that we are attending and. Yeah, see, there's the crowd there. You know, I will show you the crowd here. Okay, so it's very tough actually to work from here. But anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mao. Thank you, Dr. Goel, sir. So let's have some questions. <laughs> Interaction. Dr. Saklani? Yes, sir, sir. I am waiting for your paper, which you had promised that, me. Please. Oh, yeah, yeah. One more. Actually, yeah, yeah, sir. Now, 100%. percent. Please that send it problem. as quickly as possible so that we can incorporate yes. it in sure. the commemoration volume. Sure. I'll do that. Yeah. Okay, artist uh, Dr. Saklani, actually, your, in your lecture, 
you have said so many things and so interesting. But I wanted to know, regarding that you are saying that all the PhD students should try to come out with one product in the yes. product. But the main problem is the fund requirement. They don't have money. Most of our researchers don't have money. They are just, uh, I mean, to bring out the uh, product or to do some entrepreneurship or innovation, they require fund. Whether uh, the government of India has any special incubation center or fund or innovation fund for students like that while doing PhD. Okay. Should I answer the question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, you know, what I request basically those who are working, now this is a different time we are living in. So in olden days, we had really difficulty to talk to the entrepreneurs, talk to the industry, talk to some like in a related areas. But I think now in this IT arena, in this IT time, every student there well, well versed with the technology. They can connect with the people very fine, very nicely and very fast. It's very easy for them. See, for example, I was, uh, when I was with Niper, I remember, you know, we would ask our student to find industry for yourself, connect with them, and we will, you know, they will collaborate with the industry. So similarly, every student, they has a responsibility to really find and connect for themselves, for their product. Yeah, uh, that is true, that is true. That is true. Yeah. No, it's a little difficult, but it's possible. It's not really, you know, too tough nowadays. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I am uh, uh, Dr. Sashidharan. Uh, your uh, talk was very informative, Dr. Aravind. I have a small uh, clarification to be asked. Uh, yes, of course, we have to uh, record the ethnobotanical information or the traditional knowledge. So when it goes to the public domain, uh, the next uh, step is the perhaps in many cases the over exploitation starts or the unsustainable exploitation starts. And uh, with the result that the population of the species probably many of the uh, herbal plants which were once upon a time very common in the country uh, our countryside has uh, fast uh, vanishing they have been fast vanishing um, perhaps um, unsustainable uh, exploitation or collection by many pharmaceutical companies and uh, other nutraceutical companies and so on how to circumvent this issue because it is a, uh, an issue which is going to uh, be faced by the bio resources of our country okay okay all right so dr sachidharan i have a simple like you know maybe solution for that whoever is working on you know such medicinal knowledge or something like you know important indigenous knowledge it is their responsibility not to disclose outside see when we are documenting something we have to protect it first and then put in the public domain you put in public domain to the extent where it can be used only for general purpose we have lot many information already in public domain so somebody i remember when i was at naipur one person came which says this is unique for me you know nobody knows this outside world i showed in the literature look gentlemen what you're talking about there are hundred you know information hundred papers on that already so sometimes we this is maybe a belief but if it is real information where it can really make a change, where it can really make an impact in the society, we have to protect it first. We have to go for intellectual property right on this. This is our responsibility. So we should not blame others. Anybody who is documenting this knowledge, it is his or her responsibility to go for IT protection. Okay, and then only put in the public domain. And as I'm telling you, as of now, even everybody would agree with me. There is nothing actually in the market which has been taken by any industry and which has they have made like billion of dollars. There is hardly anything. We are we are actually you know we are uh, hungry. I mean we are really hungry for that. We are looking for some information. We are looking for at least one product on ethno medicine 
or ethnobotany, which has made real a global impact. We have to think that way, but it is our responsibility or the, anybody who is working on ethnobotany to take, take care of the IP, intellectual property, and don't blame others. This is our responsibility. Even when we are talking about this, our new act or amendment, we have given that kind of clause there. No? We are talking about benefit sharing. But benefit sharing happens only when you make something out of it, when you do something with the society, and you create something really good thing. No? Otherwise, talking just like you know, on paper, it doesn't help much. OK, thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Gol, your mic is mute. Yeah, that's why Dr. Saglani, I was asking you for this paper because sir, those sir. who are working in the field, oh, how yes. to proceed, how to collaborate, yes, yeah, yes, what are the steps uh, for the uh, uh, botany, those who are working in the field, sure. how to go for the product development, how to take the IPR or the patent issue or the, I mean, I mean, the, the this knowledge. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. I think now we, yeah, we'll document all those things at, you know, at one yes. place. Yes, what will be the yes. step? So those steps, if they come, that will yeah. open I mean, a wide arena for the researchers also, as well as for uh, writing the papers out of the different directions in which they can do how to collaborate. So that will be a good idea if I if you sure. continue with that paper. Okay. Sure. Thank we'll you very that. much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, uh, Dr. Saglani, I yeah. actually regarding this uh, documentation of preservation, uh, uh, preservation or conservation of uh, this. Uh, Ethnobotanical knowledge, mm. until unless government of India or the state government come up with some fund allocation, it will be again. It is very difficult to tell the villages or the indigenous people to conserve to, to conserve because we are experiencing from our own ministry. We have that assistant to botanic garden. But our fund allocation comes for the whole country in a year, two crore, one crore for the whole country. How can we talk about, we tell people to conserve when we are not even allocating 10, 20 crores for the whole country? And now you are talking about, about conservation of ethnobotanical uh, plants or this thing in the local area and all. Nobody will do without fund. Because in our country, Very true. most of the people are poor. They are not rich people. So if we, if the government of India or we are concerned, I think then some fund allocation should be given to all the respective uh, state or the, to uh, agency like Technical Survey of India or so, where we'll have fund to allocate to people to do the work. Otherwise, uh, uh, it is uh, easy to say, but uh, when it comes to reality, to practice, it is difficult. Uh, so what is opinion? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, Dr. Mao, I fully agree with you. You know, we have been facing this uh, for a long time, the uh, crunch of fund everywhere, especially for basic sciences. So now, fortunately, you know, I was talking to Dr. Rajesh Kotecha, Vadya Rajesh Kotecha, Secretary Ayush. Uh, and we tried actually, you know, how to incorporate our uh, traditional ethnomedicine in one chapter for that. And now it's a very good information. And for all of you, it's uh, for all of us, it's a very good news that in this global center, there will be a separate wing for ethnomedicine, for the tribal medicine. So funds, I think, should not be a problem, especially when we are working on traditional medicine. But of course, and in for conservation also, because now uh, today Prime Minister said that every place we will have Ayush, you know, medicinal park. So there, I think they will be releasing lot many funds for conservation purpose now. And we will talk to policymakers here and there, in time and again. But I think there should not be much problem, especially for medicinal plants, for conservation areas, because now it is there in mandate, in the global center. It's a, facilities coming up some 2000 crores investment and they are keeping a good fund for tribal medicine as well thank you sir uh, 
Thank you, sir. Now I would like to request Dr. Rashid Dubey, scientist E, and Mr. Dr. Singh Pune, deliver the vote of thanks for today's presentation. Honorable Director, Dr. A. Mosser, Professor Raynor W. Bushman, Dr. A. K. Goyal, Dr. Arvind Saklani, Retired Scientist of Botanical Survey of India, Head of Office of All Regional Center of BSI, whole scientific fraternity, dear participants from various parts of country who are virtually linked with us, a very good afternoon to all of you. I, Dr. Rashmi Dubey, on behalf of my organization, spread my congratulations to the Director DSI and Society of Ethnobotanists for organizing this national webinar on traditional knowledge and ethnobotany to commemorate the first death anniversary of late Dr. S.K. Jain, known as Father of Indian Botany. Through this webinar, we are giving our tribute and our remembrance to the great Indian ethnobotanist whose style of working has always inspired the entire scientific fraternity. I mention mm -hmm. my sincere sense of appreciation and thankfulness to Dr. A. A. Mao, Sir, Director Botanical Survey of India, for his enthusiastic support and his graceful opinion about the implementation. Thank you.